this is Isaiah 52 and 53. Isaiah chapter 52, the final verses, verses 13, 14, and 15, begin the description of God's righteous servant that leads into, of course, chapter 53. It's the last three verses of chapter 52 and all the verses of chapter 53. Chapter 52 is a chapter of prophecy fulfilled by the return of the remnant of, the, of 13 tribes each. A remnant of each of the 13 tribes returned to Jerusalem to build God's second temple as a holy seed. As God has forgiven their sins while they make their way back. So, chapter 52 actually ends in verse 12, which reads, for you will not depart in haste, nor will you leave in flight. For the Lord is marching before you. The God of Israel is your rear guard. Now God accomplishes this by anointing a Gentile, Cyrus of Persia, who had defeated Babylon, who had defeated the Chaldeans, they went back and forth all the time. You might say Cyrus defeated Babylon and the Chaldeans, who had defeated Assyria, where the northern kingdom uh, had been uh, deported to, all that land, all the land of Babylon. The northern kingdom was defeated by the Assyrians and deported there and Assyria imported Gentiles, presumably Arabs, into the northern kingdom. Which, this is why when they return, they all go to Judah. Now many people believe that there were ten lost tribes from the Talmud. And from, I would say, to an extent, misreading the scripture and what it, what it says or not taking it all together. Because there is a reference when Cyrus makes his declaration that he has been anointed by God to be king of all the nations of the world and he has been appointed the task by God of rebuilding God's temple in, in Jerusalem. So Cyrus issues a declaration and it is to all of God's people. It's to all 13 tribes. Any of you amongst you who want to return to Jerusalem and build this temple, you may go. Safe passage. This is how God went before the exiles of Assyria and Babylon, and how he was marching in the rear. Uh, uh, in the rear. He got Cyrus to let them go for free. That's why there's no haste and no flight. They got to pack the stuff, make the trip plans, and head back to Jerusalem, which is not hard to find. I mean, you do have the Mediterranean there. <laughs> Just go along it long enough, and you're going to hit the promised land. And Egypt, and then... <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think there's any reason to believe they were lost. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah make it quite certain. This is what it sound. Uh, this was one Chronicles, no Ezra chapter one verse two. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you and all of his people, all of his people. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem that is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, the God that is in Jerusalem. 
and then verse, and then it picks up from there. So the chiefs of the clans of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, which is the thirteenth tribe. So you really have thirteen and ten, not twelve and ten. There's three tribes right there. All whose spirit has been roused by God, they got ready to go up to build the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And this is what Ezra has to say in chapter 3, verse 1. And this has to do with the returning of the exiles. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites, being settled in their towns in Judah, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. When the people of Israel gather as one man, it is all twelve tribes and the priestly tribe of the Levites as Israel, which is how some people interpret Isaiah 53, to be the people of Israel by the name Israel, when they gather as one man. In 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, the first to settle in their towns, again the exiles, on their property that they took when they got back, nobody had been there, during the exile were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judaites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and Manassehites. There's two more tribes. Where are these lost tribes? Everybody comes back. God's prophecy was, I'm pulling them all back. In the four corners of the earth, which would have been the Middle East in that day and time, as far as anybody knew. So we know Benjamites came back, Judahites, Levites, Manessahites, Ephraim, and which, by the way, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah were the largest landholders. Those are the names you're going to mention. And of course, you will mention the priestly tribe, the Levites. And not necessarily the smaller lot owners of the great partition by Moses and Joshua in the promised land. Verses 13 through 15 are combined multiple verses by quotes, except most renditions of the translation of the Hebrew to English don't have the quotes. The Jewish Publication Society, to decide to start from scratch in 1956 or 7, and just get the original Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew text that we have on the Hebrew Bible, and they started from scratch. It's the best rendition you can find. A lot of it because of the knowledge in the world in 1957, versus lots of renditions that are used from back in the town in days. Shabbat.org. They use a version that has the commentary of Rashi, does not have the quotes. And it is important. It shows the demarcation between verse 12 and 13, 14, and 15, describing the righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 10, and 11. That also goes for Art Scroll, a great publisher of Jewish works that's uh, uh, aimed at the orthodox of Judaism, they don't have the quotes either. And interesting enough, after those three multiple verses, six more appear. The first six verses of Isaiah 53 are put together by quotes. Verse 1 starts with a quote, verse 6 ends with the quote. And that's important. Many people interpret these witnesses of verse 1 of chapter 53 as being the kings of nations that were startled 
that is in Isaiah 13, 14, and 15. But it's not. It's the people who were ma are made righteous by the righteous servant. They're the ones. Who can believe what we have heard? Who can believe our report? It is them. They have recognized this man that God describes. They've recognized him by the verses, by the description. Every verse descriptive. And they're, they're, they're trying to basically spread the word. He is here. The righteous servant of God. Which means, of course, God's here. God's got to gotta tell him, you know, who he is and teach him and, and tell him, uh, I am the one that gave you cancer. I chose to. And it exposed you to death. That's in verse 12. But I give you long life. But I give you long life. It's supposed to die. Even in the, the Christian version, they say God brought this righteous servant to the to grief with illness. Well, if you, illness is not the right word. It's disease. But be that as it may, you don't fall to grief if you've got the common cold of the foot. When he says sickness, he means a sickness that exposes you to death. Today, of course, we think of cancer first. Verse 2, and this is very interesting because it, it combines really with those in chapter 52. For he is grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. In 50, chapter 52, they talk about uh, his image was such uh, that you could not even recognize him as human. But here's the best description of it. He comes from a Christian country. That's the air ground. And you say, well, wait a minute. How can you possibly know he comes from a, a Christian country? Because of Isaiah 63, God says, or it's first written, Who is this coming from Adam with blood spattering his clothes, etc., etc.? There's a lot to Isaiah 63. And God says, It is I, and I come in victory. Adam in the town, and God knew the Jewish people were going to do this. He knew the town that was going to be made by the way he wrote the Torah, leaving so much information out on his commandments. In the Talmud, the Saul, the eternal enemy of his brother Jacob, is associated with Adam, who became associated with Rome. Then Rome Christianity, Rome fell, and today a reference to Adam is to Christianity. And God knew that, why else would he have a verse written that that's where he's coming from? And when? Malachi 3. I'm going, I'm sending my messenger, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. And the messenger is to clear the way and deliver the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. Now, his name's Elijah, and that's interesting, because Elijah is the messenger of Malachi 3. I'm going to get back to the man described as a Gentile in just a moment. Because it says, who's just coming from the dom? And God says, of the peoples, none were with me. There's no Jews with me. That's the peoples he's talking about. And there's, as I said, there's a lot more than this, but I'm just going to keep it right there dealing with chapter 52 in the first six verses of chapter 53. In Malachi 3, God sends Elijah back, but he's the only man to be taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible, specifically. Specifically takes him, the chariots of God, take him up 
in a whirlwind and his body disappears. And then he sends him back. What do you ask the man who says he's Elijah? Tell us about heaven. Tell us every mystery of heaven there is. That's a proof that there's a better one. I'll get to that. Because you wouldn't necessarily believe what he said. It's one. That it is helpful. And that's and he's the man to select also for this reason. God also says in verse 1, the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Well, if Elijah is the messenger and he's from heaven, then he's got to know the angel. And they can converse. Turns out that's the angel of God's presence, I believe. Angel of God's presence. Wherever God's presence is, which is his mind, it's what he feels he is. It was, it's what of God, the consciousness of the universe, enters into the temple. And he has his spirit around him. So you have you have this this Holy Spirit, that wherever God's presence is, the Holy Spirit is. And wherever his presence is, the angel is. I believe that God created an angel. And as its body, physical form that we cannot see from the unseen realm of God, is the spirit of God itself. It's not the likeness of the human being with wings. And God puts this in Isaiah 63. That's why I'm bringing it up. And also, of course, why you pick Elijah. He can talk to the angel. The angel delivers the message. Elijah delivers it to the world. And God comes in the time of the end, of course. <clears throat> There's just too many people to do it differently. I mean, I often wonder, how did everybody hear Moses on the mountain? There's a million people and no microphones. <laughs> Pass it back, I guess. So, in two, we have a Gentile. Now, why did God do that? Now, he used Cyrus of Persia. He used Cyrus of Persia, a Gentile, to set the exiles free when God forgave their sins. And the message that Elijah's going to have is the new covenant is here, everybody's forgiven. Starts, everything starts going hand in hand after a while. Jesus was a Jew. And if you think God didn't know that was going to happen with the Gentiles, then you don't understand why he chose to crush the man with disease. See, he's blemished. God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. So he's going to bring... Now, of course, the Christians are going to say, well, we don't care what Judaism says in the town. They say Adam is, is Christianity. You know, they're not going to listen to you. For the Jewish people, you got to see magnificence when it happens to you with what God is doing. Because he says, when I come back, those who told you to get down on the ground and walk all over you, he says in chapter 51, he's going to pass his wrath to them from the Jews. That's chapter 51. That's just a couple short of 52 and 3. It's not short, actually. He's coming with vengeance against them. He plans, in my opinion, based on what I'm saying, to take out the cornerstones of the churches and the cornerstones of the Vatican and let it start to all fall away. Over time, of course. So the airy ground from this chapter 53, verse 2, is a Christian country in the names of a Gentile. Now, you can imagine what the Jewish people are going to think about a Gentile being the anointed one, Moshe, the sin of David. It's not going to go over well at all. And that's why it says he had no form or beauty. We can't even look at a Gentile. Just, <laughs> just keep your distance. If you don't believe a word you're saying, you're a liar. And they shunned and despised him. Held him of no account. That's the next verse. But clearly he gets it all taken care of and makes his way because he ends up making the many righteous of the Jewish people. Isaiah 11 says he has an abode to be honored. He's buried in a rich man's grave. 
So it's all going to work out for me. He's just got to get to Israel, convert Orthodox, and become an Israeli citizen, and make sure everybody realizes wherever he goes, God goes. Just like Moses. If you went and found Moses, you figured God's real close by. It's the same with this man. The prophet like Moses, it's Elijah, descendant of David, and we have one description. God sends four men, and he gives one description. This righteous servant is going to have the capabilities, the attributes of whatever it takes to do whatever Elijah can do, whatever the prophet like Moses can do, whatever the descendant of David can do. And he calls them, my servant David, a shepherd. It's not a king. There is no kingdom to be gathered. God knew Israel was going to be a democratic country. He knows everything from beginning to end. That's how you can see how all... You know, you've got three different books. you got Isaiah describing the righteous servant. You have Jeremiah giving you a new covenant that he ends up delivering. Because his purpose is the same as Elijah. Believe it or not, Elijah recounts us the father to the son and the son to the father by drawing them back to Judaism, which means to righteousness with the new amendment to the first covenant, be mindful of the, of the teachings I gave Moses of the laws and rules and commandments for all of his men. He's making the many righteous, and his purpose might prosper. God says, if he doesn't get it done, I'm going to come with an utter destruction. Basically, that means Elijah's got to be recognized for who he is, the righteous servant. And he's got to draw people to him because no one can have that temple built by themselves. And that's what God's saying. If you don't build it, the day is going to come that that land is going to be utterly destroyed. He doesn't mean he's going to do it in his power any more than he raised up the Babylonians or the Assyrians or Rome as armies because the Jews wouldn't stop sinning. Lift the sword against you. Pestilence. Now, all those things were happening. God just took credit for it. To put fear into the Jewish people. To make them fear him, heed him, listen to him. Which means his prophets and, you know, they even, they laughed at Ezekiel. They laughed at Ezekiel, which is interesting. It's Ezekiel. That is the key to Isaiah 53. The very same thing. A spirit of God alights upon him. That's Isaiah one of uh, chapter eleven, one and two. A spirit shall light upon him. It's a little bit different with Ezekiel. He said <laughs> God was telling him to get up on his feet. He says, At that moment, a spirit entered into me. And I could hear God's words. Now this is actually, I've got well over five documentations in the scripture for what I'm about to say. But it's a whole other video. God is in his spirit. This whole, his way of communicating, and it falls true for all the prophets, for Moses, and there's back up for it. He tells, I'll give you one, he tells the Israelites. I'm sending my angel before you. Do not disobey him. He will not forgive you. For my name, Hashem, is in him. What does that mean? Moses, walking along, he notices a burning bush. And that doesn't burn up. He stops. The angel of the Lord is in the burning bush. Now, he can't. you can't see the angel of the Lord. You can't, you can't see spirit, and that's his body. You can't see it. And then God speaks to him. Guess what? God is in his spirit. He's in that angel. I have a lot on that, by the way. So, Ezekiel. So what happens? How does he this man 53? Well, right off the bat, 
in chapter 53, you have a verse that says this man is taken from, from the land of the living. Okay, but this man gets long life. He's, he's exposed to this. But that doesn't, he's cut off from the land of the living, if I said that wrong. Yeah, he's cut off from. That just means you can't get to it. You can't have it. God tells Ezekiel, go to your house. I'm putting the cords of my power around you, and you shall not go out amongst the people. He just took him from society. Why? To change his nature. Ezekiel says, that spirit entered into me. The spirit seized me. I went in bitterness and in fury of my spirit in the hand of God. What does that mean? Why are you all mad and furious? Because God's got you. What happened? <laughs> it's the words of Isaiah. Punishment, chastisement, maltreatment. Crushing and bruising. It's like taming a wild horse. If you've ever seen from Texas, if you ever see that, they put that horse through hell. They beat on him, they pull it, they yank it to the ground, over and over until finally the horse just stands there and says, okay, get on. I can't, I can't take this anymore. I'm fine. You know, Moses, who I can assure you went through this process that Ezekiel goes through, which the next thing that happens is he's 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 pinned to the ground. God says, You'll stay here on the ground, and I'm putting the cords on your side, facing Jerusalem, and I'm gonna put the cords of my power around your wrist behind your back. He binds his arms behind his back for over a year. I think it's three hundred and ninety days on one side, and then for forty days he gets to flip over on the other side. One for the sins, Notice it's, it's called the punishment of, but what do you think the punishment is for? It's for the sins of the house of Judah and the sins of the house of Israel. You see the same words popping up in chapter 53. And all that's really being talked about is God's fire of refinement, like taking a cadet in the army and making him into a Navy SEAL, a Green Beret. It's just making him right. Now, Moses, you know, was, you know, he had a furious spirit, too. He killed a man. He got so angry. And he was fighting. But at the end of his life, the scripture says, Moses was the most humble man on earth. Now, I know he did a lot of things, but none of which would really humble you. If anything, you're going to get real full of yourself leading a million people to a new land, and God is with you the whole time. But uh, now became the most humble. You know who he was? He's that horse. He's that horse. You said, that okay. guy. So, look, I wrote your books for you. And he comes in after a long day, gets in the tent, and God says, Moses, get your stylus and some parchment. We got, we got a leper scholar of the Talmud versus Jesus of the New Testament. In Isaiah 53. What is his name? The rabbis, the scribes, said his name is the leper scholar. As it is written, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God, and afflicted. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant. They are the ones made righteous. They are announcing their belief in the man today who is described in these 12 verses. Why today? Because today is the day of the Lord, according to Jeremiah and Malachi chapter 3, the last words of God to the prophets, where he is prophetically announces the day of the Lord, when he will return, sending his messenger before him to clear the way, and the angel of the covenant 
that you desire is already coming. Well, the, there's only two covenants that God has not delivered. The covenant of friendship and the new covenant for a time to come in Jeremiah. What is the time to come? It's when the Jewish people return after the land has laid in desolation, after they had been dispersed by the Romans. Jeremiah is writing for the diaspora. He is not writing for the exiles of Assyria Babylon. The time to come is today. It began in 1948 when the Jewish people returned after the Holocaust and created Israel. And today it blooms again. That's seed time is coming, beginning with chapter 31, verse 28. The new covenant is discussed in chapter 31, verse 31. And then the last seed of time that's coming is chapter 31, verse 38. And it says, when Jerusalem is rebuilt from certain markers, biblical markers, and it's much greater and bigger than that today. That's it. See, a time is coming. The land blooms again. That's my summation of that, uh, that paragraph, which begins with the verse 28. <clears throat> See, a time is coming. The land blooms again, which means the Jewish people have returned. Jerusalem's been rebuilt. And so the new covenant is here. All that's, that's, that's happens. You know, now it's just, okay, how do the Jewish people find out about it? I mean, how do we know? Well, the same way you knew with Moses. He told you. Somebody who speaks with God and tells you God's words. That's what Isaiah 53 is for. It's for God's representative of him in the day of the Lord to be identified today so he can deliver the covenant to you. The angel's going to give it to him and he's going to deliver it. And God will be waiting to return to his temple. In this day, because there is no temple, it must be rebuilt. Clearing the way for God is building the temple. Now who's to do that? Well, it's Elijah. Contrary to Ramban and all his thoughts on, uh, we'll know who the descendant of David is because he will build the temple. Well, no single man is going to go and remove Islam from, from the temple mound and build the temple and go, see, it is me. It's not going to happen. God, and God knows that. That may have made sense in Ramban's day. You know, he believed that the descendant of David was going to come back and uh, uh, restart the Davidic dynasty as though the king, the line of the kings, a new line of the kings of Judah, the first line was banished. Um, which is why in chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, the descendant of David is described as the twig growing from the shoot, or a twig from the shoot growing from the stump of Jesse. The stump is what's left when the only ancestral tree we know of has been cut down. And that's the lines of the kings of Judah. So he comes, he comes from a line of David through King Solomon, who also had an eternal kingship covenant with God. And of all those children of his thousand wives and whoever else, that's where this twig comes from. He's not a branch. He's a twig. Which means, you know, he's very far removed from who King David actually is. He's a different man entirely. As you can see by these verses of a man who is considered a leper. Smitten. Afflicted. None of which describe Jesus Christ by any stretch. And that's just the beginning of why he is not the man described. But the most important part is for the day of the Lord. Now, Jesus proclaimed a day of the Lord, but it couldn't be because the day of the Lord is found and see a time is coming. Well, Jerusalem hadn't been destroyed. The land hadn't laid desolate. 
The Jewish people didn't have to return. They were there. God didn't have to return to his temple. The temple was there, and he was in it. It was in the day of the Lord. Now, back back to Malachi 3, verse 1. God says, I, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. Okay, he will when we open the doors for him. <laughs> but he's going to have to be here before that to prepare this man, his representative, just like he prepared Moses, got him ready, told him, you know, here's here's the proof you'll have to convince the Israelites of who I am. Which, which wasn't much. I'm not talking about the ten miracles that did occur. I'm talking about how did he get them to listen to him to begin with. He didn't give them much. He didn't give him much at all. But uh, that, that's in the Torah. You can find it. But why Elijah? Okay, well that is so interesting because Elijah is the only man specifically taken to heaven by God. The chariots of God take him, he goes up in a whirlwind, his body disappears, and God sends him back. Now I talked about this in a previous video, but for one it gives him a proof of who he is. He can tell yes, he tell us all about heaven, tell us the mysteries of heaven. Tell us about angels. How, how were they created? When, when did it all start? You know, all kinds of questions. Um, but most importantly, he's from heaven, and God would have taught this man, this man described, will be taught all these things, so he can be, quote, Elijah, <clears throat> while he's preparing him to be suitable for God's purpose. You know, but, so, Elijah can talk to the angel. He is supposed to know the angel. You know, for the scripture. And then he delivers it. But first and foremost, he has to be identified by these verses. The Jewish people have to recognize him by these verses, and that's what the witnesses are talking about in verse 1. Who can believe our report? Well, it's hard to get anybody to believe. It's hard to believe. Particularly when you have, you know, two billion Christians saying it's Jesus. You had today, the current teaching today, through outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism, is that Isaiah 53 describes the people Israel. Well, now, they can't represent God. Well, who's he going to get in this day of the Lord? Who, who, how's he going to do it? What are the proofs a man has? This is his only proof. And if you go, if you go and just tell somebody, uh, this is the day of the Lord and I'm the righteous servant of God. You know, or I'm Elijah. So, you know, where, where's the proof? And, and, and so the Jews today who are interested in 53, they have shut their minds down. I don't believe they, most of them have seen the arguments that go behind this concept of Isaiah 53. I, I, I'd like to see one of them, just one. I haven't been able to find them. Of course, I haven't looked that hard. To tell me how the people of Israel were crushed with disease so that they would offer themselves for guilt to God be given a long life, see their children, and make the many righteous by their knowledge. It hasn't ever happened. How could it happen? Somebody try to explain that to me. That's verse 1. But here's, what, here's the kind of things they would be saying based on the scripture. Who could, they would be saying, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with written sin forgiveness from Jeremiah, that this is the time to come, that is delivered by the messenger of Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, who is the angel of God's presence, who is the Holy Spirit of God, who is the Holy Spirit of God. Judaism doesn't even recognize the Holy Spirit of God as being a person. And yet, he speaks. 
He takes Ezekiel, the Spirit of God takes Ezekiel on a vision. And and purposely, God has shown, look, I'm separate and apart from him. My Holy Spirit, the Spirit that had engulfed him. Because in Ezekiel, he leaves Ezekiel and goes and stands upon a mountain east of Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit still with Ezekiel, the Spirit that enters him that he talks about, that sees him. And when he entered him, Ezekiel could hear God's words because God was in him. Who can believe? Oh, yeah, right. Judaism <laughs> doesn't see him as a person. Well, he is. And see, that's why you don't understand who wrestled with Jacob. I know Judaism says Jacob wrestled with an angel. This is when Jacob got his name changed. Now, it's very simple. It's a, a man in divine beings, which I'll get to, but that is a host of the Lord of hosts. And that's based on Three verses in Joshua that you know this. But it's all over the scripture. <laughs> Every single prophet was a man of divine beings to speak and write God's words. Because it's the angel of his presence, which you find in Isaiah 63, who is the Holy Spirit. They're both. What it is is, God creates an angel, and for his body, he uses the spirit. That's what the spirit probably was created for. Wherever God's presence is, the angel is. Wherever God's presence is, his Holy Spirit is. See, the, it's the same thing. And, you know, he says, my Holy Spirit is grieved in Isaiah 63 if the Jews disobey God. Well, that's a person. It's not an inanimate object. So, what do we have? Whatever God, whenever the Spirit of God alights upon a man, God's right there too. If, and as Ezekiel said, the Spirit injured me, and I could hear God speak. It's because they're right together. God is still one. He created this angel of his presence. He created the Spirit in general. He created all things. But he's always with this angel, the angel of the Lord, the spirit that enters into Ezekiel. The minute you see the spirit did and he hears God, you know it's, it's, the, angel, it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, while God's out on the hill east of Jerusalem, takes Ezekiel, takes Ezekiel in a vision. And when he comes back, he goes and tells all his friends the things the Lord has shown him, he says. It's like, and that's not the first verse. They can become almost interchangeable. So what happened? Jacob's sleeping. He's got his head on the stone, as I recall it. <laughs> yeah, his cat's on heading back to meet up with the south. And, you know, it's very easy. God says to his angel, uh, today I'm going to form the Jewish people. I'm going to really begin it. I started with Abram when I called, when I had so and so right down the Hebrew would have been Moses. And just out of nowhere. He became he wasn't born Hebrew. God just made it up, put it in there, man. Just like the word Jew. First time you see it, it's not it has nothing to do with Judah. If anything, it's uh it comes from Hebrew, which ends E W. And it and, and we first see it when they're in exile. The Assyrian Babylon exile in Persia. Well, by that time, the tribes have, are becoming diluted. They're intermarrying. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, man. Yeah, you're bad. <clears throat> They're intermarrying. And, and so... The, uh, the pure Hebrew blood has, is being diluted. And for whatever reason, God decided to use the Jew. You know, and that makes the Jewish people recognizable, just the name. And then you have all of his commandments and laws or addresses different. 
the, the way they, they act and treat other people is different. They're very kind to other people. Because God requires that of them, if they're observant Jews. If they're observant, because God tells them. He doesn't say, love your neighbor necessarily. He says, be good to your neighbor, help your neighbor. If you see a, a goat go out of his fence, go get his goat for him. Don't ask him for interest. Don't ask him for payment. Do good in the world. Be a light to people. And they really try, and they do a great job. But they're only 2% of the population of this planet. There's only so much can be done. But that's why you pick Elijah anyway. So, so what do we have? God is sending four men, only one description. Now, he, God knows he's got to have a description. And basically, this man is the prophet like Moses. He's God's representative. He'll be able to speak God's words, deliver a covenant. That's Elijah. Uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 11, even, even the scribes and the rabbis believe that that man in chapter 11 is described in Isaiah 53. And then, of course, we have the righteous servant, and he is described. That's, that's four men that, that, that one man described in Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord that's here. So this is who we're looking for. So what happens in, um, with these covenants of friendship? This is what God says he's going to do. And it goes hand in hand with clear the way, clear the way for me to return to my temple. It's as though God already knows it's not going to be there. Why? He knew what Rome was going to do. He knew about the dispersal. That's why Jeremiah wrote chapter 31. Because in his covenant, this, this is everything the covenant covers. It shows up. He first says it in chapter 34 of Ezekiel. Then chapter 37 concludes it. He will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The land shall bloom again. As though he's already been here, giving them a hand in making the land bloom again. His people. I don't know how much rain they have. I know they can do just about anything with water. There's something else with their irrigation processes. It's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful country. The Jewish people shall continue, God says, with his covenant that he makes when he gets here. David doesn't deliver it. The David is here when the covenant is delivered by God. Because he includes... It, it, I'll get to it. <laughs> the Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil and never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them. His presence shall rest over them, and when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations, the world of the Gentiles, will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel, and of course the Jewish people. And that day is here. You say, well, what about all the Christians and everything? Well, let's see. Chapter 51 of Isaiah, before God's representative is uh, uh, a rock, and we're to find him with these verses. God says to the Jewish people, I am taking my, the cup of my wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, and I am passing it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. That would be Christianity. And the world in general, too. That's why he's going to sanctify Israel before the nations. The importance of rebuilding the temple today is multiplied exponentially in Malachi 3. Because Elijah is the one to clear the way. He is also to be the messenger. And he is also to read counsel, the father to the son, the sons to the father. 
Biblical renditions today of the translation will say family members to family members. And that that's verse 23. Well, verse 22 is the amendment to the new covenant. This is why it's a new covenant. It's not because he says, I'm going to forgive your sins and that will write Torah on your heart. No, the real amendment is, and this is what makes it new. It's, it's the first covenant. I will be your God. You will be my people, obey my laws. Except now he says in verse 22, Malachi 3, Be mindful of my teachings I gave Moses at Oreb of my laws, commandments, and rules for all of Israel. Next thing you see, uh, Elijah shall recounts everybody. Well, clearly, he's bringing them back to Judaism, which means righteousness. And if he's not successful, God says, when I come, if Elijah can't get this done, which means be recognized as Elijah, then I'm coming with utter destruction to the land. Utter destruction to the land. There are approximately 7 million Israeli Jews today. Now, if that doesn't ring a bell that chimes, never forget, I don't know what will. Why on earth are the Jewish people looking for David? It's Elijah that you want. He gets short shifts. It's like Randy and said, man, you know, it's better that we go study Torah. We can't figure out if Elijah comes before David or after. All he's interested in is the, the, the Davidic dynasty. Well, God knew Israel was going to be a democratic country. He knows all things. That's why you can't just say our sages say and come up with this messianic area. And you can't teach this to kids that would, but suddenly nobody in the world has a flaw. Everybody is perfected. There's no sin. Women don't feel pain in childbirth and on and on. You can find all this in my book. I've got two books that have not been published yet, but you can find them at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. They'll get published eventually. And everything on my videos comes from those books. Uh, be, you know, read them for free today, and, and buy, when they get published, buy a copy for your coffee table. Be sure to send a copy to your favorite rabbi and your favorite Christian. Why do I say that? Here's something else you never hear. God, when he comes, has a reckoning with the shepherds, with the rabbis, religious leaders, has a reckoning, and he dismisses them. I'd like to ask them, well, let's, let's just say your messy error er is going to happen. What about the rabbis who were dismissed by God? You're not dismissed from your synagogues, you know that. Now you dismiss before the eyes of God. You're no longer in right standing with Him. You're as though you are a person who does not heed Him, esteem His name, and revere His name. That's what you become when you're dismissed. Because He doesn't pay any attention to them, now He's not going to pay attention to you. You say, why would He do that? Because you never listen to His prophets, is what He tell you. This time you're going to. If you don't want to be dismissed, you better listen to my representative. And he did the same thing with Moses. When he had the, he was being contested and the people, they brought lanterns out and did this and that. And anyway, one, the bad guys went down into a, a great big hole. I guess hell, I don't know where they went. And you I mean, let me get back to this man, Divine Banks. Okay, so, so, here's Jacob sleeping, and God tells his spirit, I'm going to change his name to Israel today. Just like one time he said to him, hey, I got, I'm going <laughs> he doesn't talk like that, I'm sure. I'm going to, I'm going to go down and kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt. I'm going to get those people out of here. And he said, you know what? He probably, but see, I believe the angel, if y'all see angel, I think the angel of his presence. And the first page of Genesis is when you first see it. And uh, the, the spirit was hovering over the waters and God says to him, there's the only other person on the page, there's the only other person in the chapter. I hear people say he's talking to the host of angels or, or the heavenly realm. Well, why? There's the spirit. It's because you don't believe he's a person. And you know what else you miss? You don't know what a host of the Lord's host is. You don't know what a man of divine beings is. It's very simple. 
So God says, okay, let's go. Look, there's a man sleeping over here. Let's go to him. God said, God wakes him up and says, I am the God of this land. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have something for you to do, a task. And he says, okay, here I am. Because that's what apparently you do when God tells you to do something. You just get up and say, okay, I'm ready. Well, he just became a man in divine being. That's what, that's what Jacob said he wrestled with. <coughs> Why didn't he say I wrestled with an angel if he wrestled with an angel? But it's very simple. The divine beings are God and the Holy Spirit, who is a person. And he <laughs> the word of the Lord. Do you know who that is? It's the messenger of God's, of God's words. Because apparently God didn't like to talk that much. The word of the Lord came to me and said, God says, and then we see it repeated. You know, so he's the angel of death. He's the word of the Lord. He's, he's the angel of his presence. He's the Holy Spirit. Uh, also referred to as the Spirit. He's the angel of the Lord. And uh, th this should open up your, your scripture reading. You know, leave the town for a little while. Let Ram Bam have his sauce. Look at what he says. This, I just read to you what God says in his covenant. It's no taunts. You'll be saved. You know, you're not going to be dispersed again. Here's what Ramban says. Here's your Messianic era. And the kings of Mo uh, uh, his chapter 12. Of the laws concerning King Moshe. <laughs> that Moshe will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah. Well, there's an easy task, right? Okay, this is saying I am David. Let's just, let's just say I am. The same of David. How am I going to get all of Israel follow the Torah. What about the second people? What about the atheists? What about the just good non-observant Jews? I guess that's secular, I'm not sure. He's going to perfect the entire world, motivating every nation to serve God together with the Jews. Let's go. Come join us. Well, we are the Jews. Exalt us. You gotta be kidding! You can't teach this stuff to new to people, to young people. They grew up on the internet. Everything is fake news. Everything is fake. They don't believe anything until you prove it to them. Well, you, you have to understand. I was an atheist for fifty years. I, I'm not a religious person. I, I'm a commentator. I, I read it. I believe in God. I didn't, uh, but at age fifty, after. Uh, Picking back up with Isaiah 53, verse 1. The witnesses will report, and who would believe it, that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua is a harbinger of God's righteous servant. The account of a man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and captain of the Lord's host is the first and only time in the scripture <clears throat> the scripture describes a host of the Lord's host. The captain of the Lord's host is a host. This is how Joshua chapter 5 verses 13 through 15. That's three powerful little verses. Once, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him, drawn sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and asked him, Are you one of us or of our enemy? He replied, No, I am captain of the Lord's host. Now I have come. Joshua threw himself face down to the ground said to him, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So what do we have? Joshua threw himself to the ground before a man with a drawn sword, that he just told him that he was not an Israelite. And Joshua said, what does my Lord command his servant? The man said he was a captain, not a Lord, not the Lord. 
The captain answered, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. These are the exact same words God said to Moses. I believe at the burning bush when he first talked to him. God is with this captain. And where God is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. He is a man in divine things. And Joshua can recognize it. He just knows. Either that or God is already speaking to him. Spirit to spirit. You would call it telepathy, I suppose. But if I explained how it all works to you, and it is explained in my books, it's really spirit to spirit. The captain says, now I have come. But he's never mentioned in a scripture again. He's a harbinger of God's righteous servant, also a Gentile, upon whom the Spirit of God alights, making him a man in divine beings, which is a host of the Lord's host. A Gentile who arise in the time to come of the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 in the day of the Lord. God wrote a harbinger in the book of Joshua, and he didn't put it in the Torah. He didn't want anybody to know but me so that I could offer it to the people, particularly the Jewish people, as a further proof of who I am. Although there's nothing stronger than the books. I couldn't have written them any more than Moses wrote the to Torah. It's just not possible. It's not even remote. I couldn't even write. I'm just not a writer. I, I was a lawyer, uh, but I was a book lawyer. Land titles, oil, gas, and mineral law. I researched old records and ran, uh, prepared genealogy, uh, genealogical uh, ancestral trees and tracked mineral owners for oil companies. And it, it, I loved it. I loved it. Loved being a lawyer. I loved law school. And uh, one of the first things, in the first two weeks, God told me, you're not, you're not going to practice law anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have you terminate your licenses in, uh, here in Texas where you're board by a board certified specialist, but also in Hawaii, which uh, I had gotten kind of fall back in retirement. And that's, uh, that's when I found out I had colon cancer. Well, that's when I got sick. I didn't know what it was for about three more months. But anyway... Um, Another example, Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Every time you see the name Elijah, uh, there may be a few exceptions, he's the Tishbite. An inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Gilead is like a dome. It's east of the River Jordan. It's a Syrian Arab territory. And Ramoth is a town within it. He's an inhabitant. The Israelites didn't go and live amongst the Arabs, and the Arabs didn't come and live amongst the Israelites. He's <laughs> just too dangerous. He's a Gentile. And God is telling you over and over and over again. Every time he says this way, I ran Chronicles, uh, everything in the Kings, all the genealogical information I could find on the tribes, and it, you can't find any, everything, but there's no Tishbite. There's no reason to be calling him a Tishbite. That's a clan of a tribe. You're calling Elijah of Judah, the Elijah of Benjamin. You know, Benjamin, is, his land is where Jerusalem is. That's what's so important about Benjamin. Uh, Judah and Manasseh, and Ephraim were the largest uh, landholders. And uh, of course, the Levites are poor. And I, I, I mention this because I left out Benjamin in a prior video. And, and Benjamin is listed as uh, some of the 13 tribes that returned. 
And, and that would be one. You list the large lot owners and uh, the, the priestly tribe, and of course Benjamin, because that's where Jerusalem is. Elijah and Elisha were also hosts of the Lord's hosts. This is from Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 6. As they were crossing, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before you are <clears throat> before I am taken from you? Elisha answered, Let a double portion of your spirit pass on to me. There's a footnote for the words, a double portion. And the footnote is two-thirds. And it references here Zechariah 13 and 8 that says, Throughout the land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall perish, shall die, and one-third of it shall survive. How is it a double portion, which is what Elisha says he would like, two-thirds of the Spirit? Where the person of the Spirit is, so is the person of His presence of the Holy God. The angel of His presence and God are always together. There will be two persons of Spirit with the Spirit of Elijah, or three persons within one man. But all three are separate and distinct, never forming a one. Elijah is taken to heaven, and His Spirit with it. With him, his body disappears, his spirit goes to heaven. A double person, that's God and his spirit, then a light upon Elisha. There's the double. You had a triple, and now it's a double. That's what's left to go into Elisha, and then he starts performing the same miracles as Elijah had been performing. And, of course, miracles uh, are, are always in, and only in, the power of God. God's with him. God's there, spirit's there. So he's a host. And anybody who says, any prophet who says, the Lord says, the, you know, God says, the word of the Lord came to me, and God said, then he's telling them what's right. I mean, he's saying those words. They're not just scribbling as fast as they can. I mean, he's sitting with them. He's talking to them uh, within their minds. Spirit enters into them, and everybody's in here. You know, he can project himself. I mean, he's within a man, and he's with them. I mean, his presence is, is apparently very large, and so is the, so is the Spirit. But they, it's like it's like two clouds. You have you have God, His presence, which are which is His mind. It's where He feels He is, just like we do, where we go, our mind goes, and that's where we're at. And that's what goes into the temple along with His. Here's another cloud along with His spirit, which together make the uh, Shekinah. And it's as though these two clouds are just drifted together. If you look in the sky, two clouds come together and they look like one cloud, but you knew they were separate. So they descend upon this man, and let's say there's, there's other people in the room. Everybody else into the room except, let's say, David. That's what God calls Mashiach. That presence of God and the presence of the Spirit, which surrounds your bodies, completely surround them. But not so with Moshiach. With Moshiach, they would flow through him. His little spirit of his body is now a small cloud that's in with the two big clouds. That's just the easiest way to think about it. Ezekiel was the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine beings. Ezekiel says, And he said to me, O mortal, Stand up on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. There, there it is. I mean, that's, that's how it, that, <laughs> That's a man in the divine being. What happens with Moshe? The spirit of God alights upon him. God is in that spirit. 
That's just who Moshiach is. And Moshiach is described in Isaiah 53. For the day of the Lord, God needs a representative. There's nothing he can't do with God power and the power behind him. His literal thoughts, just like Ezekiel, his power surrounds Moshiach. He can, he can he, he handle all of his physical movements, his self-will, and even his self-thoughts. Complete control of the man. And that's what God did with Moses, with David, all your greats, Isaiah, and even the lesser ones who just wrote a few pages. And except for a couple of exceptions, every one of them experienced God's sovereign refinement to an extent. Largely it had to do with their task. For instance, the man who wrestled with Jacob, God just made it in for a few hours, you know, for one night, and didn't really take the time to do anything to make him a better person, because that's what it does, it's final refinement. It's brutal. Your soul screams. I beg for death a thousand times. I cursed him a thousand more. Yeah. How fast he will leave. And then I try to be nice about it. Don't you have something to do in heaven? Can't you leave for a while? <laughs> they don't have to stop talking. And they don't sleep. I average two to three hours a night. Today, 13 years later since he spoke to me when I was 50. Picking up on the last video. And I had already gone through cancer. And that's my, that, that's, next to the books, it's the biggest proof I've got. Nobody can show that they are the righteous servant because of verse 10, unless you're that man. Verse 10, God chose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. And he might, might receive long life, see his children, and by his knowledge, he shall make the many righteous, and the many becomes a multitude. It's the offering yourself for guilt. You can't prove it. How do you prove it? Well, there is one way. I had colon cancer. I mentioned this in a video uh, the Lord just had me put together. But basically, it was colon cancer. Uh, it's just about stage four, shouldn't have lived. And uh, but they were able to cut it out, took chemo, it never came back. Then they did tests, and they told me bad news. It metastasized. It spread from your colon. It's in your lungs. And they showed me the pictures, and it's just all, you know, the stars of the night, white dots. And uh, they said that every dot is, is cancer. And we can't, it's untreatable. It, it's just too far advanced. And I said, well, what do you mean you're not going to treat it? And he said, well, you're going to die and you're going to die soon. And I haven't seen a doctor again since that day for anything, for any ailment whatsoever. And that was when the planes hit New York 20 years ago. God has told me since he, I was like 43. And he didn't speak to me until I was 50. But he'd been with me from the womb. Guiding my, or saving my life to make sure I fit these verses. Things like being done shot, just about losing my right leg. All these things are chronicled in my book, The Life of the Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53. It's my book. But guess what? Just like the other book, Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord, I didn't write it. I typed it. He dictated it to me. Now, he spent five years teaching me everything. And I kept learning as we wrote blog, had blog writings for another five years. And then we took some 117 blog writings and turned it into about 50 chapters for uh, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. And then in about a week's time, about a month ago, he, he knocked out my autobiography, which is well over 100 pages, almost 180 pages long. And... Uh, because I was already familiar with the subject matter, so he didn't really have to teach me much. But they're written by him. I mean, it's scripture. It's it's it's, it's uh, uh, put together. 
in divinity. I, I don't know how you really say that. It's not, obviously, it's not canonized into a Bible or anything, but they're his words, you know. So when you hear me talking about things like the Holy Spirit is a person, or this is what host of the Lord's host is, or um, just, you know, th there, here's a way to think about God, to cl uh, a cloud and his spirit and Moshiach and what will happen, because that, that's me. They flow through me. They, it's, it's more of a stag. It's not a flow. But my spirit is engulfed in what is all around me, in my mind, in my, my spinal cord. Things that he, he can hurt you with during the fire of refinement. There's, there's no pain that I can think of he hasn't put on me. But um, it's just his way. It's brutal. It's just his way. And, of course, now, you know, and I, I, he took me to poverty right away. Uh, and he'd take me out on these 15, 20 mile walks. One summer, one summer in August here in Texas, in Houston, uh, it went over 100 degrees every single day. And every single day he had me up at dawn, walking till sunset. And I didn't have a dime. I couldn't buy water or a soda. You know what he's, he's still talking about the excess. Well, you should have seen how thirsty they got. He said, this is, but here's what you don't know. Thirst is a great thing because it gives you the energy, the wherewithal to get back home where water is. It keeps you moving. That's what I had to put up with. He's so funny when he's not torturing you. And tor I asked him that. I said, I see crushing, bruising, maltreatment, punishment, wounding, chastisement. Where, where, oh where, is torment, torture, and heinous acts of cruelty and violence? Violence. <laughs> Can't imagine what all he's done to me. And he told me right the bat. Right around when he told me I wasn't going to practice law anymore. <laughs> Your pain doesn't mean anything to me. I am God. And I didn't really even get the concept. And when he told me he had me shot, to start the cancer, <laughs> I said, well, did, did that make you feel bad? You've been with me since I was a baby, right? And he said, Ken, I'm God. I said, I know you got it. Did it bother you? See, I talked to him friend to friend just like Moses did. That's what it means. We talk, we talk to each other like that. Well, he doesn't talk to me like that, but the Holy Spirit does. And he is the funniest person in creation next to God. They have different, they're, they're funny in different words. The Holy Spirit's uh, comedy is more appealing to me. It's for sillier people. But uh, no, God, his personality, you can't really know him from the tour. And he wants you to know him through me. He wants me to tell you these stories to an extent. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's just like any person you meet or your best friend. They have a wide ranging personality. He's not just stop sinning or I'll raise an army against you and drive you from the land. He's not just angry. He's not just, you have to be perfect. I mean, look, he's coming with sin forgiveness. And he said, yeah, okay, he says, I've been sinning again. He says, you think I didn't know people were going to sin? You think I didn't know when I had Moses make the first covenant with you that she, they weren't going to break camp. Well, he's right. He's all over the place sinning. There, there's probably some of them sitting back there looking and seeing somebody's wife or looking around and seeing somebody's wallet sticking out of the pocket. You know, and not even listening. I mean, and they, you know, this is a wild people. I, I say sadness because they would eat the food uncooked. And, uh, but, you know, if you, if you watch the Christmas shows here in America and you see the times of Jesus and how the people were, you're not getting a true picture. <laughs> I, said, I promise you. And he says, you wouldn't want to meet Moses, Elijah, David. You wouldn't want to meet any of them. They'd scare you to death. And he wouldn't be able to reason with them. They had one track mind. Uh, but uh, anyway, let me pick back up. So that's Lord's a host. But I have, I have another one. This is the last one. It has Abraham in it. Uh, and this comes from, I didn't write down the chapter and verse. A host is symbolized in the story where God appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing 
near him. There's a footnote to that page on the Hebrew word. I don't speak Hebrew. And it says three men near him, and then the footnote indicates to his left, above and to his right, and then near him. Well, the Holy Spirit almost always talks to me right here to my left. I don't know what this Hebrew word is. And God, generally, if we're not talking within my mind itself, Generally, he's talking to me up to my right. I don't know. I'm in a 16 by 16 room like he's in the corner of it. And this is face to face. His power envelops me. Ezekiel called it, or God called it in Ezekiel, the cause of his power. To me, his power has just like been poured over me, almost like it's a suit. It's, I'm completely enveloped in it from my head to my toes. And, you know, he can move me. He's heavy. His presence is heavy. I don't just hear his words. You know, and he can move me around. He can bump me into a wall. Sometimes it, we're out walking and an invisible hand just knocks me in the shoulder like a friend would. You know, I'm like, hey, come on. So I said, stop concentrating. And he comes to the spirit, well, you concentrating on walking. I said, no. He's a person too. When I first think of the Holy Spirit, I'm thinking, it must be just some bright, light, white power, this entity that you, you know, you, and all you do is feel love and peace in his presence and you want to fall down. That's not him. That's not him. He's, he, he's got a caricature of himself. He has no form just like God. If there was going to be a son of God, this is who it is. This is God's constant companion. It's like he made himself a family. And uh, this is his constant companion. You know, and he makes God laugh. And, and if there's anything God likes to do, you know, he's been around so long, his emotions, you know, he's a being in existence with motion. That's, that's our image in him. Let's make him in our image. It's a being in existence with emotions. Okay, but, and, and that includes him, but, you know, he's God. I mean, he, you can't really get him too excited about anything. So he makes things up, like Christians. <laughs> Somebody to make him mad, picking on his chosen. So, but, he's just so much. I mean, I've lived with him for 13 years, day and night. And like I said, I really get to have a good night's sleep. It never ends. I've gone from knowing so little and being so furious, just like Ezekiel and I, I would suggest Moses. I mean, I, I got in fights all the time. It's in, it's in the book. I mean, I was getting in fights in the second grade. In the second grade, I broke the glasses of the principal of the elementary school and shattered his orbital bone of his eye with my foot. <laughs> I don't know how old you are in the second grade, but anyway, I had trouble. Okay, picking back up my Canon EOS M50. Apparently, can only record for 30 minutes and it goes up. I don't know why that is. I don't understand camera but so I've never really had one. <laughs> you know, I've never done these kind of things. I still, excuse me. Waiting, <laughs> waiting on lights. I've got one, I need another one. Um, which I'm getting with my pan pandem uh, pandemic stimulus check. Because, God, as I said, God took me to poverty. I don't have anything. I don't have bank account, credit cards. Uh, I don't have a driver's license. He, he didn't pay to renew it. It's just, you know, but, and, and, you know, I did fairly well as a lawyer. I, I, pretty, I know what it's like to have money. Uh, and to be able to buy whatever you want, for the most part. You know, within reason, upper middle class. But uh, I've, I've had no problem living like this. I've had, it's just, you, they keep me too busy to even think about. You know, hey, I need to go to work and get a job. And they'll tell me, you're not working. You work for us. <laughs> I said, y'all don't pay anything. He said, it, it'll work out for you long run. So anyway, take him back up. So here's Abraham sitting at the tent, three men near him. And, and God speaks. 
these three men represent, they symbolize a man with divine beings. It's three persons, the Lord and the angel of his presence with a man. Two of the men are described as angels in the next chapter of Genesis. Okay, they're only called men in this chapter for the purpose of symbolizing a host. You know, it says these three men are God. Well, no, they're not. It's just three men. They symbolize that God has actually probably come up to Abraham with a man, with a man in divine beings. Like the man that he used to wrestle with Jacob. Just got somebody. You know, you do whatever he says. I mean, he can control your mind. And he can control your body. And he can make anything on you hurt badly. Like meals. Anyway, they, they, it's in the books. If you want to find out a little bit more, it's in the books. Uh, my book, The Chronicle of My Life. You know, I tell God, this is how we can talk to him. I tell him sometimes, I'll, as serious as I can, I'll say, God, listen, when I get some money, I'm going to get you to Israel. You know, you don't need to worry about these things. <laughs> you know, just, we just cut up. I mean, I live in a room with God and God's Spirit. The, they both have great humor. And uh, when God is not just putting it on me, which has been all of, it's gotten worse every year. The last three years have been far worse than the first three years. Every year, it's gotten tougher and tougher. He says, well, it's harder to draw emotions from me. Because that's what he's been doing. And then he coats me in his power. It's like a pillow. Uh, so that when I go out amongst the people who shun and despise me, uh, you know, it's all in the verses. It's not easy to tell people, oh, yeah, I'm him. Uh, <laughs> except I have no problem at this point. That's why it took 13 years. He's been coating me and coating me, angering me, hurting my feelings, embarrassing me putting me in terrible predicaments, putting put me in a state of worry that's ridiculous because I don't control anything. He controls everything. There's not one thing that comes from my lips that I have to worry about. And even that took a long time to get used to because he controls it. I can't say anything that he hasn't already certified as A-OK. -okay. And he knows the way I thought. I asked him, when he told me what... <laughs> One night he's telling me, and by the way, he takes me on, he used to take me on visions all the time, and they're always sending pictures to my mind. And that's in the book, I'm not going to go into it, but <laughs> this is an example of embarrassment. He just shut me down. I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> so I'm going to carry on. Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? which is his redemption, victory, and vindication from a sinful man whose life has been lowly. And this is based on the verses. Uh, although it tracks mine very well if you read the book. <laughs> you don't plug it on, man. Right? Full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon him to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. Oh. And I told him, you're going to take a Gentile from Texas. And you're going to raise me to great heights with the Jewish people in Israel as somebody called Moshe. This is before I knew we were going to include Elijah, prophet like Moses, I didn't know who Moshe was, the sin of the David, and a righteous servant. I had never heard of Isaiah 53. I hadn't read the Bible. And so when we finally get one night, he just says, read Isaiah 53. I said, okay. You know, because supposedly I offer myself for guilt, not for what the scripture says, and he gives me a long line. Well, I didn't even know what any of those terms meant. So he says, read Isaiah 53. Get you tonight. He's always telling me what to do. Go get you tonight. Read 53. Now, who do you think that is? I said, I have no idea. I, 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 I don't know what it's saying. I said, I think these verses ought to be up here. I said, somebody fooled with that? He said, no, nobody fooled with it. So, anyway, he said, that is you. I said, huh, huh. 
Okay. <laughs> I said, it's sure going to be hard to make people understand that. He said, no, you'll be surprised. Wait till we get through with it <laughs> over a couple of years. So I mean, it's taking some real money on my part to see all these things. And I hadn't even gotten to the test of devotion like Abraham and the binding of Isaac. That's what the offering for guilt ends up being because it's the guilt and emotion. It's the guilt, the, Jew, the sickness of the Jewish people that they talk about in verses 1 through 6 is not being righteous. And they feel guilty. It's an emotion that makes you sick to your stomach. You know, I'm really not doing right by God and, and my family and everybody because I'm just not following His commandments like I should as a, an observant Jew. So this, this is the, the woes of an observant Jew. So I'm offering myself for that guilt. But he doesn't put guilt on time. You can't put the guilt of the Jewish people on a man. He's blow up. It's too much. And, it, it doesn't, you know, a human being can only feel so much guilt. And that's not what happens. No, he says, if you do this, I'm going to put you through a training period. It's my fire refinement. I change you. I add my power to your emotions. I get you where I want you. I teach you everything you need to know. Which is like with Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, eat this scroll. It tastes like honey. That's God teaching Ezekiel. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't literally eat it, but he had to learn things. That's what that was about. And then you can make these people righteous, and they will no longer feel this emotion of guilt. So you're suffering all these things, it says in the verse. He, you know, by his, he bore our sins by his wounds. And all those words like that. That's, that's what it's about. Their sickness is righteousness. I do take all that suffering, but it's to turn me into the righteous servant. It's not to be a sacrifice for the sins of all people or anything like that. And then here's the here's what I've learned just recently. So this test of devotion, the test is the angels already here. You know how I keep reading if you've been watching the videos, Malachi chapter three, verse one, and the angel is already on the way. God says, I'm coming. Messenger Elijah's coming. Angel's already coming. <laughs> the angel's already taking off. And I never understood that. I'd read it. He wouldn't tell me what it meant until I actually I was typing it up one day. It was with the book. It wasn't even a blog. Um, when he told me to offer myself with guilt, and he says, you might have a long life. Mind you, I'm still thinking about the cancer that crushed my life. And seeing my children, I'd have said yes to just about anything, even though it was might. And that's the test of devotion. Will I offer myself to go through this thing, not even sure of what I'm getting at it, not even understanding what's going on. Much less how much pain and suffering he's talking about. But the angel's here, and what does the angel have? The new covenant. Sin forgiveness. An amendment. An amendment be mindful of the laws I gave Moses. Yeah, it's, it's the same covenant. He keeps saying that. I'll be your God. You will be my people. Follow the laws of Moses. I, I gave Moses. It's not. Only, it's it's only new in the sense that he 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 tempered it. He said, "Okay, be mindful," and that that's up for debate by uh, the Jewish uh, religious movements, the the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox, the conservative. You know, but that's just like the Torah. They ought to love it. What does mindful? What does God mean by mindful? You know, what did He mean by Shabbat? How did we celebrate? It? What are we supposed to do? Well, it came down to an old tradition. Well, start your own, own tradition on mindful. I'm sure that's going to be a to do between, for instance, ultra-Orthodox and conservative or reform. But anyway, I, you know, I don't, he kept me away from the tour in the town, and I use the town just to know what it is. And he takes me there. Go to your computer. Go look at this. Go look at that. And, you know, sometimes he sends me down rabbit trails. I'll try to research something for days. And they say, you know what, I don't want to use that. <laughs> Anything to draw emotion from me. And I tell you what, and you're reading the book, I never smile. I never laugh. And 
going through this process, you would think that would continue. It's been the exact opposite. I just laugh and smile every day, not all day long. Like, and we watch movies all the time. I, 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 you know, it, it, it keeps me busy and they make all kinds of comments. Sometimes they just flat out drive me crazy. And they, then anyway, on we go. You know, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but anyway, who's the arm of God been revealed? His vindication. And that, this man, I, this lowly man, with all these problems, and, and it's such a dysfunctional home that, that scarred me, like it does, you know, his, you know, drugs, alcohol, my mom, she, she, four members of her family committed suicide. Her mother committed suicide with arsenic. In the town square of Crockett, Texas, in the middle of the night, you know, back in that time, that she was marked as that kid whose mother committed suicide in front for all to see. So she's living with her father. He takes a pistol and blows his head and puts a bullet in his head. So that's both sides of the family are committing suicide now. She is adopted by her father's brother, her and her sister. One day, and she's older, she's getting close to her teens. She's out in East Texas, where I should say I don't I don't want to live in East Texas, but um, it's a lot of trailer homes out that way. But uh, he blew his head off with a shotgun in front of her, and I'm sure there was a lot of booze involved. So anyway, she's had psychological, psychiatric problems, uh, but you know I'm still taking care. of I live with, I, I don't have any money, but I take care of my parents and I get to live in the condominium and they buy the food with their social security. Basically, we've been living on their social security, uh, but mine uh, kicked in uh, when I turned 63 to five early, so I finally can buy a soda at the store, <laughs> which used to not be a big deal, but now it's like, whew, that's the best soda I've ever had. The guy says, hey, it's good for you. And you get to be with your parents. You, their whole lives, you know, 92 and 85, and I'm not going to have them forever. But here's Jesus. Jesus spoke a prophecy on more than one occasion. And this has to do with vindication, okay? The verse says, Who is the arm of the Lord? Then reveal them. His vindication, his redemption. You know, that would be on the Jews today. Get this thing going. But uh, he spoke a prophecy on more than one occasion that he would return in his generation. He used people's lives as a, a measurement for when he would return uh, after he's lifted to heaven. This is, this is uh, uh, not to be confused with rising from the grave on Easter, which is highly contested by lots of people. But, but from there, he's lifted to heaven, and now he's supposed to be returned. That's what the rapture is about. He's going to appear. All these things are going to happen. Calamity in the world and on and on. Some 52 verses in this chapter. And, and, and these are the things Christians look for because it means he's going to appear in the sky with a bow of a horn. And, but they don't see the last verse. Just like they don't see crushed with disease with Isaiah 53. They don't see that the man lived. They don't see the man has children. Just you know, they don't. They don't see that this is a description of a man's life of suffering, not just having a bad day at the end. It's the only time he suffered. I figure it to be about twelve hours. Twelve hours. So. And when I got a gut shot. I was in there, and we got to this small hospital, and all I could say was, "You've got to give me something for pain." And they said, "Your vital signs are so low." If I give you a shot of morphine, you're going to drop dead right there. And I said, I don't care. Give it to me. And they wouldn't. But I had to hang on for eight hours in the back of the ambulance. And I couldn't, I knew if I fell asleep, I knew if I passed out, I wasn't coming back. I was just too weak. And you know, and so he's up here on the cross, and then it, and he, all of a sudden he says, Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? 
where he's happening. He's getting ready to die. Who does he say he is? The man of Isaiah 53. What happens to him? He's exposed to death, but given a long life. Somebody just found out they're not the man of Isaiah 53 after all. Because he expected God, no matter what he walked himself into, and with the Romans going into Jerusalem, where he's supposed to defeat Rome by the prophecy he quoted, he absolutely changed the prophecy. In his own words, he changed the prophecy in Zechariah, the man who rides in Athens to Jerusalem, because the next verse is, the next verse is, he put it all together, he defeats Rome, defeats the enemy, and Jesus' time would have been on. And he changed it. This 12 went and got the ass, and he tells to them, I'm going to ride this ass into Jerusalem, and there, the Gentile, and he says, all the prophets say of me. I will ride this ass in, and there the Gentiles will mock me, spit on me, scourge me, and kill me. But on the third day, I shall rise. Brother Jesus, I got 20 prophets right here in the Hebrew Bible, and there's not one of them that says that. As a matter of fact, there's no book anywhere that could be considered scripture that wasn't canonized, just didn't make it into the Bible. There's no place that that's ever been discovered. It was made up by somebody who knew that they couldn't defeat the enemy, and that's what he's supposed to do. It's why the Jews won't believe in him, among many other good, good reasons. In particular, he doesn't fit these verses. But he did. He changed it. That, I mean, that's a lie. to see. His prophecy, you high priest shall see me will come, return. You, members of my twelve, there will be those amongst you who are alive. When I return, you, the people of Caesarea, there will be those amongst you who will be alive when I return. My Savior, the book of Revelation that we hear so much about, the calamity that's coming to the world and in particular the Jews when Jesus puts you in hell for not believing in you. First chapter, Revelation 7 verse, speaking to the angel, which is like being a host. God can speak through people and that. He can speak through me. He can just flat take over, which is a very peculiar, spooky feeling. But uh, he says, those who pierce me with the spear shall see me return. That would have been on the cross when they wanted to make sure he was dead and stabbed him in the heart with the spear. Well, they're all dead. And he said, oh, anyway, all these calamities and everything in this great 52 verse, it ends up with, and my generation shall not pass until these things are done. Again, lies in vain. They're all dead. Why? And then, and then the last page of the New Testament, Revelations again, last page, three times he says he's returning quickly. Three times. <laughs> three verses. I'm returning quickly. I'm returning quickly. I'm returning quickly. Now, why is he saying all that? Because he knew he had not done what he was supposed to do. But if he was God, he could come down and defeat Rome. Just hold on, y'all. I'm going to take care of this. Just, i got to die first. But we find that on the cross. Abba, Abba, Abba. Father, Father, Father. Now, if I sound so eminent, remember, I'm bringing God's wrath to him. I'm telling him, guess who is? the man of Isaiah 53. So see, I'm representing God and his wrath, but I had to go to cancer because of the ridiculous beliefs. That's why it's in there. God could have just seized me like he seized Ezekiel. I didn't have, but he, I had to be blemished. He touched my arm in the womb, he tells me. And I don't have a right breast, my shoulder's shorter, and I got a withered right arm. It works fine. Uh, it's just not strong, you know, prefer not to have it, doesn't look good, but just for this 53, that, you can't imagine what I've come through, but it's in a book, and even then, I don't know if you can truly get it, but that, that's, um, that finishes up verse 1, and I could do verse 2, but <laughs> actually, I, I hope the light's getting good. The lighting, I got one light in today. I need to get the other one to be a YouTuber. This <laughs> is really funny. Yeah, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't even know how to use a computer. 
Anytime he, he put my Facebook together, he put Twitter together, he, you know, showed me how to be a word processor. Now, I was a lawyer. We had secretaries. I, I never had anything to do with it. You know, I would dictate title opinions, big books of uh, title history for old companies. And, and I practice every other. There's nothing I didn't do. I tried cases, criminal and civil, um, arbitrations. Just about, patent law, I think, is the only thing I didn't get dabble in at some time or another. Had my own practice for a good while. But uh, anyway, I'll pick up with um, verse 2, which I talked about before, but I've got some interesting things to add to it. Thank you. The leper scholar versus Jesus, chapter 53, verse 2. For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. This is another reference to the righteous servant initially being repulsive to the Jewish people, though finally accepted by many and then a multitude of them, those that are made righteous. Those who are his witnesses, who can believe our report, who can believe what we have heard. In Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, he's described as so marred in his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. But even so, he startles many nations and kings are silent by him and he is exalted and raised to great heights so here in verse 2 it says he had no form of beauty in verse 14 his appearance is so marred beyond human semblance it's one or two things he's been afflicted by god in these verses and affliction can be disease you can be afflicted by god with disfigurement at birth King David would have nothing to do with the blind, the lame, <clears throat> the crippled, you know, unlike Jesus. <clears throat> because the belief in those days was that God did not like these people. And so David, he didn't want to be around people that God didn't like. So he just had nothing to do with it. Or... It can be, as, as I'll point out in just a moment, that it's because the man's a Gentile. And the last thing in the world the Jewish people are expecting from their Moshiach of chapter 11, who's described in chapter 53, according to the sages in the Talmud, uh, although uh, Rashi, many years after the Talmud was completed, decided that uh, he had a different idea. Well, he was wrong. It's not, it's not all of the Jewish people as the man of Israel. It's not a song. As it is said, uh, which is from Bernard Dunham, a Christian, a, uh, a commentator on the Old Testament of the Holy Bible, which of course is the Hebrew Bible with several, uh, a few changes here and there. <clears throat> and, and that alone, that, that, that makes, you know, that don't, it's an extreme, more behind, uh, beyond uh, human appearance, and this is unlike that of man. He just doesn't look like other people to the Jewish person. They like to look upon their own. They have a Jewish state. They like the Jewish people, and they want their savior, so to speak. Their Moshe, the one who's going to bring this great exaltation and redemption and messianic era of perfection in the world. No flaws, no faults, no sin, no pain. Food for everybody. This ut a utopia. And it's not the only re <laughs> religion to have that. They kind of all seem to end that way. Or have, uh, uh, everything's going to be wonderful for us because we're right. Well, 
This man grows by the favor of God like a tree crown. A dot, and again, this is continuing the symbolism of an ancestral tree. This, this son of Jesse from chapter 11. Once again, God is using, as he has this written, as Isaiah writes this, this man grows like a tree crown. So this is the great heights because a dominant tree crown reaches over all other plants in the forest, including the crowns of other trees. This man is lifted up high. This man whose appearance is marred, he has no form or beauty. We did not find him pleasing. It all changes. It all changes. A lot of it is just disbelief that God is actually doing what he said he was going to do, and he's doing it when he said he was going to do, unlike Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ prophesied his return by, by the measurement of lives and being. His generation, people alive when he was born. Everyone alive when Jesus is born. It's his generation. When they're all dead, his generation is over. He gathers his twelve. There are those amongst you who will see me return. You know they did. You high priest, you shall see me return. No, they didn't. You, the people of Caesarea, there are those amongst you who will be alive when I return. No, they weren't. <laughs> they're all dead. My favorite, the book of Revelation. Speaking through an angel to the writer of the revelation, those, this is Jesus, those who pierce me with the spear shall see me return. No, they didn't. There's, that's, there's five of them. There's, that's five false prophecies. The other is his generation. He, he, his prediction of his return with all this calamity in the world. There's a, a chapter that's got like 52 verses. He tells his, he gathers his, his, his 12 or some of them and he's telling them all this. This is going to happen. The temple's going to be destroyed. Um, on and on. And those are the things that Christians look for, for his return. Which, as I said, he used lines in being and he uses it in that chapter. The last verse says, my generation shall not pass until all these things occur. Some of them actually did occur. But he didn't come back. And it wasn't all of them by any stretch of the imagination. False prophecy. False God. And what else did he say? Last page of the Revelation. Three times. I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Three different verses. That's what he's saying. Why? Because he knew he hadn't done what the Moshe is supposed to do, which is defeat Rome. I believe he felt he had to die, become God, come back, and then he could defeat Rome. Because on the cross, he found out he was wrong about everything. This man of Isaiah 53, as he proclaimed in his own Christianity beliefs today, the belief that Isaiah 53 says a man is crucified and by his blood we are saved and sinless and go to heaven. Which isn't in Isaiah 53. The man is given long life. He makes him any righteous by his knowledge. If the airy ground is in a Christian country and his form was a Gentile under the Jewish law, the Halakha, would he be attractive and pleasing to the Jewish people? Not at all. But if he comes from a Christian country with God to Israel and converts Orthodox Judaism and becomes an Israeli citizen, the many who become a multitude made righteous will most likely look favorably upon him. And I think they will. Verse 3, he was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. 
As one who hid his face from us, he was despised, we held him of no account. He will be despised and shunned and held no account simply for declaring that he is the Lord's righteous servant, described in Isaiah 53, particularly being a Gentile and from an arid land. Christianity with God's wrath passed to them in Isaiah 51. And the rabbis reckoned with and dismissed. And of course, God is using his righteous servant for that purpose in the day of the Lord. It's part of the day of the Lord. It's his vindication, his revenge. Where that fits into the Messianic era, I don't know. You know, that whole, it's selective. It's selective. Well, we like this. We, we, we like it that a, a man of 100 years is going to be but a child. We like everybody to be perfect. We like everybody to uh, destroy their weapons and um, come and take care of us with the money they had. You know, it was break down our uh, their swords into plowshares and till the ground for the Jews. Well, how about we come deliver atomic bombs? How about Russia? They got quite a bit of them. You want to come and break them down into plowshares? Sure, it's a metaphor. You really think the people of Bible land are going to come and take care of you? It's selective because you leave so much out. Where's the day of the Lord? Where's his vengeance? Where's his wrath on Christianity? You, you, you say that I, as Moshiach, am going to go and convince two billion Christians that the Jews have been right all along and that there is no Jesus and never was. And no, no one died for their sins. They're going to be responsible for their sins. Now, that isn't what you think, is it? You think God's going to come down and change the minds of every human being on this planet. For you, because you suffer. Well, he's making a heaven just for you. And if anybody wants to be a part of that heaven, including the Christians, the Islamists, Buddhists, anyone and everyone with a different false god, they're going to have to convert to Judaism and become a Jew. And that includes your Moaites, Noahites, or Ides, Noahites. <laughs> you know, they want, and, and your Messianic Judaism folk, you know, if you want to practice Judaism, be a Jew. It's that simple. Because God is building a heaven with the name Israel endures. He's flat out says it's just for them. That's your reward. You're not getting a Messianic era. Those are verses just for the people of antiquity, an illiterate, ignorant society that love, like children, who love to be told stories. The bigger the story, the better. And the story of Jesus, I'm quite sure, was one of the most popular stories. A story that started a hundred years before his birth. If you look at where the symbolism comes from, the Essenes the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Their founder, his very name is the teacher of righteousness. Just as Jesus is thought of the man of Isaiah 53. They had their own gate at Jerusalem. And they had it all the way to the destruction of the second temple in year 70 common era. You think they didn't hear this story about Jesus? Nobody ever wrote a single word about him until 40 years after his death, the Gospel of Mark, 40 years after, and what was happening then. And so that story had been going on for 170 years. It's a great story. It's got all kinds of miracles and walking on water and raising dead, things that people of that time, they just like believed in those kind of things. Resurrection of the Dead. We all love zombie movies. You can just turn on the TV and get one. So we must love them. I've watched many of them. But I don't believe you can raise dust if there's anything dust left of the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt. And yet, that's what Rambam says is going to happen. Every single Jew who has ever lived 
will rise up. What about the evil bad ones? Do they get risen up? I never saw an exception to it. What about the rabbis dismissed? Do, do, are you part of the Messianic era? Do you become flawless? Do you become without sin? Do you do that without God? Selective, selective. Ignore what you don't like. God's coming with utter destruction. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. A day of the Lord, who cares? It's our day. We have suffered. And heaven's not in eternal life. Not enough for us. We want more. We want it on earth first. Then we want it in heaven. Oh, that's right. After the Messianic era comes the world to come, and now you have described heaven on and earth. What happened to uh, Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10? Sure, he's got chapter 37 where God takes him to the field of bones and tells Ezekiel, command the bones to rise. Rise, old bones, rise. And out of nowhere, Flesh and muscle and tongue organs are flying through these bones and they become the resurrected human being. And their souls are in the realm of souls who notice that their new body has appeared and they go and reconnect with it. <laughs> Is that the same old soul you used to have? Or did God purify it in the realm of what? I hadn't read any of this in the scripture. This is what Judaism teaches. And God is living about it. Living. Because we are in the age of reason, enlightenment, knowledge, science, medicine. We're supposed, we're supposed to know what these poor people who had to live in that time didn't know. Some things just can't happen. That's why the rabbis reckon with and dismiss shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. You just heard it. Who am I, rabbis? Because you're going to have to recognize me. You're going to have to recognize these teachings. You're going to have to recognize the two books that God had me type. You're going to have to recognize it and take it to your flock. You're going to have to straighten out your errors in interpretation and teaching. To get back in right standing with him. And he can use you. He can use all your followers. He can use the new teaching being more relevant to the real world for the young people to come back to Judaism. Part of Elijah's job. Part of the job of the righteous servant of God. He does want you. But <laughs> this is God we're talking about. He's not going to He's not going to make it easy on you. He, he, you know, he never leaves the Jews. He never has. Even though he says, even your spokesperson broke my covenant. That would be Moses. <laughs> he says, you all broke it. But I married you anyway. The Christians say in that very verse right there, there's another in the book of Hebrews, another deceitful act on the part of the Christians. The writer of that book says, Right there, he's talking about the new covenant. And he's instead of, and he espoused them, he says, and he abandoned them. They just change it. You know, it's, you know, with the deceits of Jesus on, on, on the prophecy and what the prophet said about him entering Jerusalem for what they call the Last Supper, where he's supposed to not only defeat Rome, but be anointed king from sea to sea. And from ocean to land's end. I think they're describing the entirety of the world with that. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what the scripture says. It's got nothing to do with being crucified. Nothing. All the prophets say of me, and yet not one did. And then you got this kind of see. God left you. Paul did the same thing. God left you because you sinned. He came to us. He came to us, but He's forgiven our sins. Well, we can keep sinning. Do you know, God took me when he's teaching me in the New Testament to one of the mega churches here with Joe Osteen. It's a great place to go in a hot summer. I'll tell you that. They got great air conditioning. But uh, this guy, this uh, leader of the church came up to me and said, uh, you know, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
You have forgiven of every sin you have ever committed. And here's what you don't know. You're forgiven of every sin you're still going to do. Because Jesus knows you're going to do it. Well, thanks for the cart going to go do whatever you want. <laughs> so I don't have to quit sinning at all. You know, because I'm a sinner and, yeah, you know. <laughs> and this is the person who believes God before a human sacrifice for him. Okay. You know, remember, I was an atheist for 50 years. I hear things like this and I just, you know, what is going on in the world? I'm a lawyer. I've, I've seen all kinds of people. I've represented all kinds of people. But until I really got amongst the religious Christians, and God made me, <laughs> he made me watch every Christian channel there is until I knew everybody. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Can I watch a thriller or a mystery or something? So anyway, I'm going to carry on. Um, Gentiles will despise and shun the man who startles the nations and silences their leaders for announcing that he is the anointed one the Jewish people have been waiting for and that Jesus cannot possibly be the man described in Isaiah 53. The Jewish people will despise and shun me for the reason they expect and have been taught that the anointed one is Jewish, not a Gentile. In the era of exaltation, redemption, and restoration of the Messianic era, they have been taught will not be occurring. It is the nature of people to reject, despise, and hold of no account a man who has no visible proof to substantiate his claims that God speaks to him, as God spoke to Moses, that he is a man prophesied to come in the Hebrew Bible, that he is a messenger and deliverer of covenants of God, and that the Spirit of the Holy God has alighted upon him. I have but the one truth I mentioned in verse 1. I offered myself to guilt. I was supposed to be dead within a month or so, 20 years ago, and I have no... Lung cancer doesn't disappear. <laughs> Lung cancer, they said they couldn't even treat. And I had absolutely no sense of now I haven't been x rayed again, but God tells me it's just simply not there. You saw those white spots. If you did have an x ray, you wouldn't see them today. It doesn't matter to me. I don't have any symptoms. I'm doing just fine. And I've got long life, and I can already tell. See, He won't tell me the future. I'm not a prophet of the future. I'm not a seer. No man is. No man can see the future. God knows and can make prophecy because of his absolute knowledge of all things. He can think things through and go, okay, then this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. He knew when he wrote, had Malachi write the day of the Lord, that the internet was going to be here. Because he needs it to get this message for the Jews, for their redemption. For the Jews to stand up and go, see, who he told you. It's the leper scholar. Just like our sages said, and he, he's telling the Christians why we don't believe in it. And God is going to build his temple again. And the scripture said that means he sanctifies Israel and us, the Jewish people. In my opinion, this is better than the Messianic age. Because does a Jew really want the world to be a Jew? Because I know you feel special about it. God took me to a conservative synagogue. Uh, the largest one in, uh, the largest conservative synagogue in the world that's here in Houston. And um, I went to the high hall, I went to the conversion class. Uh, now, he's already told me you're going to convert Orthodox in Israel. But he had me going to the synagogue and I went to the conversion classes uh, for a while. And I did go through all the uh, holidays. I loved it. I loved the people. They were so kind and nice to me and uh, learned so much, went to the Yom Kippur services, everything. And of course, God's with me the whole time. <laughs> That's what's so nice. Puts his powers on me. If I got a little bored, he can make me just tranquil and patient. <laughs> and he's good about that. 
uh, when we're really working and it's not, he's not working me over, so to speak. But, uh, I, I mean, I found out they, they, you, the Jewish people are very proud of being a Jew. And uh, do you want everybody in the world just like you? How about this? How about 98% of the world would be Jews who converted to 2% of the naturally born Halakha Jew? Now you like those numbers. To me, I start, <laughs> I might even worry a little bit. You know why? Because they're going to take over, you know, because you all negotiate on how you're going to run your synagogue, how you're going to run your your services, and uh, all of a sudden it's 98 to 2 every time you open your mouth. They wouldn't want that. This is so much better. And it's real. It's real. And it's something your, your children can understand. You know, this is the reality of that. He is here. You tell your children that, and they're going to come back to Judaism. They're going to leave. If they, if they believe in Jesus or trying to mix it with Judaism, you show them these videos, and you say, that's God working. This is what he does. He comes and gets a man, just like Moses. That's what he does. And he gave us a description. And by his knowledge that he's revealing, we know it must be him. Moses said, who am I? I said the same thing. Who am I? They're going to listen to me, a Gentile from Texas. Moses said, who am I? And God said, tell them my name. <laughs> Moses said, what if they ask me what it is? Tell them I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, you mind you, this is 400 years after the Jacob clan left for, for Egypt. And do you mean, do they even really know? I saw one video, somebody said there was one old woman who had heard that before. And she said, it must be him. And God gave him three uh, uh, miracles, which could have been just tricks. He did give him the, the staff that turns into a snake. He gave, he told Moses, put your hand in your shirt. Pull it up. Leprosy. Put it back in. Pull it up. Gone. Remove lessons, just like he can remove cancer, apparently. In other words, I got one of the same miracles. And then take a drop of water from the Nile and drop it down. I think it says in the same and it shall turn to blood. That's it. And he had Aaron with him to try to back him up. I don't have anybody. I've always been kind of alone. I've got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> My best friend. We're real friends. <clears throat> um, anyway, Jesus, a man of suffering, this is what's being described here, you know, in this verse, a man of suffering for me with disease. Jesus wept one time. That's the shortest verse in the Christian New Testament. Jesus wept. That's it. Jesus wept. Why? Because he was, because he had just raised his friend Lazarus, who had been dead four days. You know, Jesus was dead three days, and he was Lazarus had been dead four because Jesus was late getting there. And <laughs> but, he, but but he wept because still nobody believed who he was. Which I suppose means, and I see I've heard them talk about this, uh, that, that he was the man of Isaiah 53. Or, be, right, or because of the miracles he was performing, he was God. Uh, he does indicate that in many a verse. I am God. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think he ever actually just says it like that. It's, it's just implied. But in any event, that's, that's not a life of suffering. And as far as one did, all you had is you got whipped, and you got nailed to a cross, and at the end of nine hours, he yelled to God, why did you forsake me? And then he, quote, gave up the ghost. He didn't even die, apparently. He just let his spirit go without him. <laughs> I can't tell you, there's many. If God had given us that power, people would be dropping all over the place. I can't take it anymore. I'd rather be dead. Boom. That goes your spirit, which is the ghost. He gave up his ghost. He quit trying. 
And you're talking to a man who laid in the back of an ambulance for eight hours, gut shot, hanging on with everything I had. The only thought in my mind was, you have got to hurry. And I was still saying it in the shock room of Ben Pound Hospital. You have got to hurry. But anyway, I pulled through. And went on to run track that year. <laughs> and then I got shot October 5, 1975. And uh, in early February, I, I won a high hurdles race in a comp very competitive district in Houston. And uh, it was tough getting back, but I, I enjoyed the struggle. And the suffering of trying to achieve, which it's that suffering of the Jewish people that makes you so successful, is what God tells me, and I believe it. I've learned a lot about suffering with God, and I've learned an awful lot about the suffering of the Jewish people. <clears throat> that's basically the whole, that, that's my world. It's the Jewish people, the history, uh, their lives, their daily lives, their lives as they were, the Middle East, Iran, the terrorist organization, it's Bala, all these, you know, Lebanon and everything else. Um, he's taught me well, taught me well. He hid his, his face from us. I'm reading from my uh, from a midrash, my midrash on 53. That's in uh, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord, who hid his face from us. In other words, I'm taking sections of the verse and explaining each one of them. He was despised; we held him of no account. Okay, well, a man who is despised and held of no account is not going to go out among the people. You know, until the perception of, his, of him changes. And he's asked to, which hopefully my books are going to do for him. People are going to say, this, he, didn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't know these things. There is a proof. We're the Jews. We've been expecting him. We believe God will do what he says he's going to do. But uh, at least in social media, I, I've been kicked out of many a group just for suggesting Isaiah 53 might be Isaiah. I mean, Elijah. I didn't even bother saying, well, what if he's a Gentile? <laughs> it might come after me. I don't know. You can't talk about it. It's Tobias Hanger says. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Just what he says me. <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Okay, this is certainly not Jesus. He never hit his face. He's outside. Legions of followers. He was never confined to his home like Ezekiel and me in this room. <laughs> I got taken from society just like Ezekiel. You're not going out with anybody anymore. No friends, no nothing. Uh, just me. God <laughs> says, just me and <laughs> my, my spirit. <sighs> it's been a long 13 years. <laughs> um, Yeah, Jesus, he was never despised. He was always held in high esteem. Sure, some of the, the religious leaders had it in for him. They didn't like what he was saying. And they could tell he wasn't going to be the Messiah, Moshe, that he was supposed to be Messiah, that he wasn't going to be the answer to the, the Roman occupation. Uh, but that, wouldn't, that, that wasn't the general population. Okay, well, that ends verse 3. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'll pick up verse 4. Um, <laughs> apparently this afternoon. Thank you. The leper scholar versus Jesus. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, chapter 53. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. The sickness is not being righteous. 
They suffer the sickness of not being righteous and not being in right standing with God. This describes a man that God does not like. A sinner whose life is full of bad events, sickness, and suffering. God's righteous servant will have had persistent hardships and troubles, severely injured, and have been grievously affected, especially by disease. And that's based on these words. When you go look them up in the dictionary, these are the things they name. Jesus was never, ever, not by the Romans, not by the high priest, ever accounted as being played, smitten, which is a hard blow back in antiquity, and afflicted by God, by anyone uh, in the New Testament even, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know who's never mentioned in here, in the New Testament, the Gospels, is the Essenes. You get, there was three sects, it's just like today. You got, you got the ortho, uh, you got the Orthodox, you got the Conservatives, you got the Reform. Well, here's Pharisees and here's Sadducees, and they leave out the Essenes. They never see Jesus. As I've mentioned, the Essenes had their own gate, and their founder, his very name is the teacher of righteousness, founded about a hundred years before the birth of Jesus in the story. They're prolific writers. They they actually did commentary as as the Jews did on on the scrolls on Isaiah. They had the great uh, they call it the great scroll of Isaiah. I think that is a scroll that has the entirety of the book of Isaiah, which is some almost 70 chapters, not quite. And they, they embody who Jesus is. They, they didn't want to live in Jerusalem. They went to these caves up by the Dead Sea, and they deplored material things, uh, money, but not all of them left the city. And as I said, they had a gate. And at the gate, they told stories. They just, they, they told big stories and uh, try to make some money. And of course, pick up supplies and whatever else they needed uh, up at the caves. It was, it's not that far away from Jerusalem. But if they heard that there was a man claiming to be who their founder was, they, do, they would have went and checked it out. And if there was anything to it at all, they would have wrote about it. Nothing's written. No word on Jesus. No scrawlings on a cave. Until 40 years after his death. He lived to be about 30. And then in 70 Common Era, uh, through the first of three revolts by the Jewish people against Rome, where they lost... In the first, in the first revolt, over fifty thousand people, by estimates, and an awful lot of them by crucifixion and scourging. But that's when Rome destroyed the temple and started driving the Jews from the Promised Land. There's two more revolts and. Um, each bloodier than the one before, but they finally just destroyed everything, which, and, and, and the, the Jews were dispersed eventually throughout the world. And they didn't return until 1948 after the Holocaust. The land lay desolate for over 2,000 years. And God knew this when he had Jeremiah write the New Covenant. Which basically says when the rain blooms again and Jerusalem's rebuilt, he knew it was going to be destroyed and that meant his temple. Because when he comes, he comes with a covenant of friendship that says, I will place my temple amongst you. As in, again, I will place it there. And then in Malachi 3, 
the last chapter of the prophets, God's last words to the prophets, in his prophetic announcement of the day of the Lord, he says in verse 1, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the messenger is Elijah, and he says in the angel of the covenant that you desire is on the way. He's talking about the new covenant, Jeremiah. But he was wounded. And this is first thought. But he was wounded. Oh, well, the point of all that is Verse 5, but he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet to the exiles of Assyria Babylon. Which became Persia. They, they, when they came back, they were the Persian exiles. At one point, they were the Chaldean exiles. Judah was was taken by Babylon at the time that they had control of it. It was always going back and forth between them and the Chaldeans and the Assyrians who had deported, defeated and deported the northern kingdom in Isaiah's day. Um, were taken to Assyria and Gentiles were imported, and they were there in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. They, they actually tried to stop the building of the second temple. They were trying to intercede with, with Cyrus. But this is what God says to Ezekiel, and going back to this five refinement, what all these harsh words are about, He's going to make him to be a prophet to the exile. And God tells him, I will make your face as hard as theirs. He's talking about the Jewish people, the exiles. And your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them and do not be dismayed by them. And then God maltreats and punishes him for the punishments for the sins, although that's not uh, said, but that's what the punishment would be for, of the houses of Israel and Judah. He's, he's going to toughen him up. And how's he going to do it? He's going to maltreat him. He's going to bruise him. He's going to crush him, which he does by pinning him to the ground for over a year, 390 days on one side with his arms pinned behind him. Maltreated. Well, just being pinned to the ground, maltreatment, and no telling what else went on. <clears throat> punishment and chastisement, well, he's told he's got to suffer the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah. Chastisement, there's a few examples in there. But just being told you're going to suffer the punishment of the Jews, and you spent your whole life, he's a priestly man, you spent your whole life trying to get them to abide by God's laws and commandments. And now you're being told by God himself that you're going to suffer that punishment. That's chastisement. That's hurting your feelings. And, and as I say with me, God coaches. He's using his power. He's pulling, the, he's pulling enough sorrows and pain and uh, anger and worry out of me in these 13 years and counting. And, and the whole time, it's always getting easier for me, which means he's tougher on me. It's harder to pull these emotions out. The idea is I can withstand all the shunning, all the despising, all the people counting me plagues, stricken by God, and afflicted. 
You know, you, it, b back in the days of King David, it still happens today. You have a disfigured arm like I do from birth. People, there are people out there that say, well, God just doesn't like him. That's why, that's why he looks like that. And that's what King David thought. He wouldn't have anything to do with a crippled, lame, and blind. God didn't like him. He wouldn't be around him. The Assyrian Babylonian exiles were made whole and healed only if they listened to and heeded the teachings of Ezekiel of repentance and restitution. The sickness is not being lightness. It, it's guilt. It's the emotion of guilt, being sick to your stomach because you're just a bad person. You can't get it right. You know, you're not following the commandments, and, and that's what they're for. These commandments aren't for God. He's not really worried about human sinning. He knows they're going to sin. He created us, and he knows all things. He knows the Jews are going to sin, and he knows the Gentiles are going to sin. And it's not a race. It's not, there's not a balancing act. Who sins more? That's who I'm going to be with, or who sins less. It's not... It's just not what it's about for him. These laws are for us. They're for the Jews. They're for the world who wants to, to see this, this book of morality and philosophy and how to live your life. And the Jews try to bring it to you, but, but, but everybody... There's so many people that despise them for absolutely no reasons other than that's what they were taught growing up. Prejudice anti-Semitism, bigotry, jealousy. So this is his, this is his fire of refinement that I've been under to make my face as hard as the Jewish people, my forehead as brazen as theirs, so that I won't fear them or be dismayed by them. Again, I'm a Gentile coming from Texas who was an atheist for 50 years. I don't really have any religious background except what God showed me at a Christian megachurch and at the largest conservative church in the world. And it, it, it was quite the eye-opener, I have to say that. Uh, but, but the important thing, it's such a big part of it, is his power. God tells me, I'm not, I'm not parting Red Seas on this return. He says, I, I'm not bringing locusts and frogs and killing firstborn. None of that's going to happen. The only miracles are going to be the miracles on you in controlling you in making you into what I need to have to make you suitable, to make it so you don't get angry. You know, and I have a history of that, a history of finding at the drop of a hat. You know, it's it's in it's in <laughs> it's all in the the book that my ghostwriter God had me type. He he dictated every word. Of course, I was familiar with it all, and uh, there's a lot of things left out. I would have thought, hey, you know, why don't let's put that in there? <laughs> and he said, I'll I'll, I'll I'll write the book, okay? You know, and. Uh, but it's geared towards Isaiah 53, all of my anger. I've got over 15 surgical scars, been shot through the belly. I impaled my right knee on a broken Coke bottle. It was stuck nose down in the ground with the bottom knocked off. This is the old days where Coke was made out of thick glass. My, I'm running in a field, my dog ran between, just turned into my, underneath my legs for a semi-explained reason. <laughs> I went flying through the air and came down on my knees. He said my right knee came down that Coke bottle. And for hours and hours, uh, you know, the doctors that would come in, a couple of them, said it can't, it can't be saved. I, we, I can't repair that. And then uh, all of a sudden I hear my mom, who's not very stable, she kind of lets out a yelp and, and runs out the door. And, you know, I've been in shock, but I'm watching this. And what it was is that she saw a doctor she knew, a doctor on his rounds, not there to work or really just check on things, that had repaired her grandmother's hip 
when she was in her late 80s. And back then, that was a heck of a story, a hip replacement. And she actually walked again. But she saw him, and, and she knew him, Dr. Kane, and uh, she told him to go and take his leg off. They said they can't fix it. And he came in, and everything changed. He was livid. I had been laying in that bed all day and started barking orders. And he went to go put his scrubs on, and they, they actually ran me down in a gurney to that, to that operating room. And uh, I, came, you know, I came out, I had a cast from my hip to my ankle, and he told me, you put any weight on that, you'll never walk again. She said, I think, I think we got it fixed. Anyway, it ended up, I, I, I healed up, and I ended up being a track runner. And I did the long jump, and that's pretty good. And uh, I actually jumped off of that leg, the right leg. So it, it came around. It gives me a little soreness, but, uh, but my whole life's been like that. It seemed like I was getting stitched up every two years of my life. When I was 20, I had 10 surgical scars. That's before I got shot. But, you know, and, and then I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I mentioned my mother, uh, her parents commit suicide. Her uncle commit suicide. And she's like a little girl in the way. She's just kind of in a fantasy world. Especially if she gets stressed. You know, we've always had to take care of her. Uh, she's never been a cook. She's never been a cleaner. You know, but uh, fortunately, my dad did well enough to usually have a maid around to take care of things. But it was it, it was rough, and then I developed headaches, uh, a headache that I had for over 27 years. And do you know during this time, God showed me that He was the one giving me that headache. It was like I had TMJ, and I, my jaw was just ached so bad. I even had surgery on it. In the whole side of my head, the muscular structure up here, it was just brutal to get through a day. It killed my my dreams of being a trial lawyer. I just I couldn't do it. You know, I could sit and read and and and, and write title opinions, but that was just too difficult. And it turns out it was him because he showed me because he took them away for seven years. God came to me, headaches gone. And then one day we're out walking, and I went, whoa. I said, well, that's what I saw for over 27 years. And I went, no, you didn't. And this is about what he did. He gave me a perception of this. He said, you have to be suffering servant. I said, you know, ultimately that led to my divorce and hurt my children. I tried to get on him. He said, yeah, it did. <laughs> Nothing bothers me. Anyway. Verse 5, but he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. Christian ide ideology is that by the crucifixion of Jesus, the sins of those who believe in him and accept him as their Lord and Savior are forgiven. And they receive eternal life in heaven with Jesus. Okay, this verse says he was wounded because of our sins. He was crushed because of our iniquities. There's no crucifixion here. Now, they would have to be saying we, we were sin free because of the scourging by the Romans. Well, that's not even human sacrifice. That's just taking a beat. Sure, it's a bad beat, and I give you that, but I'll say this again. One gospel says that scourging was a slap across the face. So, you know, and there's other gospels in there that, that out there that didn't make it to the Bible. I saw it on the History Channel. <laughs> there's, all, there's a bunch of it. It's pretty funny. They got all kinds of different stories for Jesus. There's even a different story in the New Testament, book of Hebrews. He says, the writer says, and he partook of the blood and the flesh with the children, so that at death he could defeat the devil and death itself. So he was planning on dying, and that, that would make him defeat the devil. This is the people you, you're dealing with on this human sacrifice. 
Th this is where it's all coming from. People who had such beliefs. Again, this is the age of reason, knowledge, information, medicine, science. But this is the kind of thing, you drink another man's blood, you give his life. Same thing the man's were saying, offer God blood, it gives life. It's take a life to do it, you know. The reasoning is not very sound from the illiterate people. Verse 6. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. There's the guilt. Now that's going to show up again in verse 10. That's going to show up in verse 10, where he is to offer himself for guilt. Well, this, this is the guilt they're talking about. It's from, it's from not being righteous. It's from being sinners. They're saying they had that guilt. Okay, well... Uh, Isaiah, that, that's his people. So that, this is the Jewish people. Now this would happen in a day of the Lord when God requires a man to be his visible representation and speak and write his words. The man of Isaiah 53, who offers himself for this gift. Take the, and, and, and that's what it is. The sickness is, I'm being righteous. What does the man do? Makes the many righteous. And say, if they listen, he, and basically, you know, tell them, get back to Judaism. Be mindful of the teachings, the amendment of the teachings that I gave Moses, laws and commandments for all of Israel. So, in the day of the Lord, a Gentile is tested by God, and upon passing the test, the man becomes the righteous servant, David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses, because he can do all those things. The, the, these names are almost symbolic. You know, David can be a warrior. Well, he can send me in to, to sit at a meeting between the high brass of the Israel Defense Force with him telling me what to tell them if they want to hear from me. Which is why I need the many and the multitude that are made righteous to say it from the rooftops why they believe, why they've read these books and can see it is impossible that I wrote them. That's the prophet like Moses. I've already handled one third of my task. I'm working on the righteous servant and Elijah. And I'm sure the characteristics of David will come to fruition someday in the future. God tells me, don't think about the Temple Mount right now. He said, it, it's, it, it looks to be an impossibility that we could ever build a temple there. He said, but just wait. It may be 10 or maybe 20 years. And again, I have long life. And I can tell this is going to take a long time, so that's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> It may be a real bear living with God, but you do have his Holy Spirit to, to lighten things up. But it's better than being dead. I've been there just about four times. And uh, gunshot, colon cancer, that was a brutal time. Uh, the lung cancer was never really affected me that much, I have to say. And then, of course, I was supposed to die at birth. I was premature, seven months, disfigured. My intestines hadn't formed, I couldn't eat, couldn't take milk, and they just, more or less, were just waiting for me to go. And uh, my mother's grandmother, the one with the broken hip, I gave him an old wife's uh, remedy, said boil rice water and get in the water. My dad said he threw out a mountain of rice in his last semester of school try, <laughs> trying to graduate from Texas A&M University where I ended up graduating myself. But uh, it's a test. And here's why it's a test. Okay, what, why, why, why did I offer myself a guilt? It's because of the, the sinning that the Jewish people are doing and the guilt they show for it. You know, for those that do. And it does. It affects a lot of people. 
And I'm, you know, just the fact that God's working in the world again should should get people a little bit more uh, fire <laughs> under their feet to get to to synagogue. And um, but that's why the angel of the Lord is already on the way in this day of the Lord when he's sitting when he's coming and Elijah's coming. And the angel of the covenant and desires on the way. That means he sent the covenant of sin forgiveness before I ever offer myself for you. And what does that mean? Well, the Jews were already sin free. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to do anything. They're sin free. They just got to know about it. All I got to do is just tell them, oh, covenant's here. You're sin free. That's making the many righteous in a, in a kind of easy way. Then I got a nice amendment. Be mindful rather than strict adherence. So that's good. And uh, that's why it's just a test. I mean, it wasn't real. And, and you know, I didn't know. It says he might give me long life, and that's how he put it to me. And I'm seeing all these words, and he's saying, the fire of refinement, these words are going <laughs> to be applied to you. And, you know, you start thinking, what's God? I mean, how bad can this be? Besides that, I want a long life. I'm going to say yes no matter what. And he could have just seized me like he did Ezekiel. But the cancer made me blemished. And what did I say at the beginning? You can't be the unblemished Lamb of God. What does that mean? God knew there was going to be a man, not necessarily his name, that the Gentiles considered someone who could forgive sins under the laws of Leviticus. So I got this figure and I had cancer and it started the cancer orchestrating me getting shot through the abdomen. And, uh, and like I said, I got over 15 scars. I got about four scars just from a gunshot. But uh, that doesn't mean the violence stops when he came and talked to me. In 2 Kings, chapter 2, verse 14, this verse, taking the mantle which had dropped from him, from Elijah, and this would be Elisha, his attendant, taking the mantle which had dropped from Elijah, he struck the water, that would be the Jordan, and said, where's the Lord, the God of Elijah? As he too struck the water, it parted to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. See, Elijah's a Gentile. If you read the story, God knows, and Elijah knows, but not everybody knows that Elijah knows. The sons of the prophets didn't think he knew, and Elisha didn't think he knew that that day God was going to take him up to heaven. But he didn't know, it turns out, if you read the dialogue. But he goes to about 300 places, but he ends up crossing the Jordan, over into Gentile territory. That's just, again, the Tishbite. There's, there's no Tishbite clan in any ge genealogy of the Hebrews that's in the Bible. So, you know, what's the point of even calling him the Tishbite if you can't figure out which tribe he's even from? So that was the point. He's from Ramoth Gilead. Gilead is north of Adam on the east side of the Jordan River. And he actually goes, he parts the water going over, and Elisha parts it using his mantle, which is his clothing, uh, like a robe, I suppose, going back. So Elisha now is working the same miracles as Elijah. That's what it tells you. But what's interesting is, this is the only place in the Hebrew Bible where God is referred to as the God of Elijah. He's always the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I know he's got another, a lot of other names, El Shaddai, etc., etc. But the God of Elijah. The God of a single Gentile. That's what that's about. That's what that's about. The God of a single Gentile. See, he wants that point of, again. He is back here with his wrath on the Christians. Now, I may sound feminine in the way I talk, but I am who he selected. And I may sound feminine regarding the reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis, but 
As God says, well, what else is the reckoning if you don't really show them how unhappy you are? And I show it through you. Because again, he controls my emotions, my moods, my every single word, even my thoughts. They're still my thoughts, but over these years, he's changed me. I think back about how I used to think and, and this and that, and it's changed. I'm not the same man I was through this process, and his power has a lot to do with it. And just learning this power, learning how to, all the different ways to communicate with him. You know, I can talk. I can thank, but there's also, he can just put a, what we refer to in here as a knowing. He can simply, I can, I'll say this way, I can have a conversation with him. Let's just say I'm thinking, and he's reading, he's understanding as though it was coming through his ears. I don't hear one thing from him, and yet I know his answer. And so then I continue the conversation. You know, I respond to what, he just sent in to me, but there's no words. It's an instant communication. It's incredible. But it took years to develop, and it took years for me to be able to, to talk with other people, to talk with my folks or this or that. And he's talking to me at the same time. To, to, not, to not let it, uh, you know, to not let it set me and, and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, 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 gotta hear something. No, it's not like that. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, so where is this God of Elijah? The Gentile Elijah, taken up in a Gentile land. And has the same purpose as the righteous servant who's a Gentile, which is me. So he returns as a Gentile. That's, that's you know, this whole story specifically taking someone to heaven. He could have taken Elijah to heaven and not talked to, not written a story about it. And, or he could have said, you know, something he does all the time, did with Moses too. You know, everybody assumes that's where Moses went, but what happened? You know, God says, your spokesperson also violated my, our, our covenant. And, uh, and then he hit the rock to get water and God had told him to uh, ask the rock for the water. And God said, you just embarrassed me in front of the Israelites. So that's it. You can't go into the promised land, which I'm sure has got all kinds of parsers and, and, and stories in the town of, you know, isn't that a little bit harsh? What's the other meaning to all this? It's kind of like seeing a prophecy that cannot be, you know, like changing the thoughts and minds of billions of people in the world so that they will exalt the Jewish people. Uh, and nations will love nations. That, that sounds like a heck of a task. He's had me for 13 years, and it's a slow process. As he says, I could have made beings that I could do such a thing with instantly, but I didn't do that. That's not my creation. My creation is not made to be changed. It's perfect. It's just what I want because I'm making a heaven for my chosen people. And anybody who wants to join them by conversion and become a Jew, that's what it's going to take. And see, there's God taking another shot to Christians. You want to go to heaven so bad? Become a Jew. See? And he brings a Gentile. <laughs> that, makes the, that makes the Jewish people mad. Seems like the odds are stacked against me. But you know what? I walk into any dark alley with God. Even though I know he'll make me fight on my own. He won't use his power to heaven. And I know that to be a fact. It's part of getting trained up. <laughs> the stories I can't tell you. Okay, that's uh, verse 6. That's the last of the virtues, verses by the witnesses of God's righteous servant. That's where the quotes end. Verses 1 through 6 are quotes. Chapter 52, 13 through 15, quotes. And it says, my servant shall be, uh, be exalted and prosper. Prosper and be exalted. Okay. And I, I've heard many rabbis say, well, uh, the servant is us. And then later in chapter 3, he calls us the righteous servant. No, no, I was the servant. And I didn't become the righteous servant until I passed the test of devotion. 
And I like to hear about the day that all the Jews gathered as one man, because that's that's what it's all about. If you're going to use the name Israel, you got to have everybody come together as one man. That's how the scripture does it. I don't think the Jews ever got together as one man, stricken by disease, every single Jew on the face of the planet, the country, wherever they were at the time, when they did this guilt offering. And they offered themselves for the guilt that they, it would translate to, we offer ourselves for the guilt that we had. Put it back on us. You know, but we'll be righteous. None of it makes sense. It, it just simply can't be them. And it certainly can't be God's representative in the day of the Lord. That's what the description is for. I'm having a tough enough time, and I fit every single verse. I say, I'm having a tough time. I don't, it, I tell God all the time, look, hey, uh, yeah, I know nobody's responding, but it's, it's just not my issue. It's your issue. It's your day. It's not my day. It's your people. You're the one who said you was going to redeem them. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> you should hear some of the conversations we have. And that, even that little argument can go on for weeks. You know, they'll be, they'll, they'll be the horse to death. That's <laughs> just like, okay, okay, I give. I give. I, I am responsible for everything. I don't. I have no self will. I don't have self thought. I don't. I can't control my own body. You control it. You control my words. You control my dreams, which is actually kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> they do. I come out of the dreams and well, let's talk about it. You know, there's some lesson in it when they let me sleep. You know, I also found out I can stay up for four straight days. He said, you're not doing anything anyway. You're just laying around here watching TV and reading scripture and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm delirious after what I see. That's what he wanted. He wanted me delirious and beat down so then he could come down hard on me with chastisement, wounding, <laughs> crushing, and bruising. And that's what it's taken to change me. And, and, and Judaism teaches that God's going to have the entire world. Speaking Hebrew, perfected, no no sins, no flaws. What? <laughs> That's not what his creation. That's not what he did. You wonder why you been pen reckoned with, and he's using me to do it and dismiss. But you know, I give you, I give you the out. Go to your flock, tell them how bad your teachings have been on this messianic era. Study and read the books. So you know, YouTube, you can make ex I mean, you can really get this thing going for God. I'm just His representative. You want to do something for Him? Come out of this mess with all your followers and raise His prophet up high and say, "That is Him." Tell the Christians, "That is Him." He fits the verses, and I'm giving you all the information you need to do it. So anyway, it picks up seven through ten. The speaker is Isaiah himself, and then God is the speaker in 11 and 12. I'll pick up there next. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. This is this is an incredible time in history. And as, I, I, as God has, has explained to me, you were actually the Holy Spirit. He said, you're so lucky. Do you know how lucky you are? He said, you, you're so lucky. It's like if it was a lottery and it was a numbers game. You'd have to take every star in the universe, and he says, and you have no idea how many that is, divided by one. That's how lucky you are to win this jackpot, to have us living with you and controlling you and making your life turning out to be something instead of, you know, dead in the ground. So, <laughs> good point. You know, I can't, you know, it's beyond belief. It's beyond something you expect to happen in your life. It's just, you know, it's just, it just is. That's where I've gotten to with it. It just is. You know, this atheist of 50 years, you know, I just, and it's a funny story when he first spoke to me. Uh, and it's in the book, I'll let you read it. <laughs> but anyway, we'll pick up with what Isaiah has to say in verse 7 through 10 at a later time. Thanks. The Leper Scholar versus Jesus in Isaiah 53. The speaker of verses 7 through 10 is Isaiah himself. Verse 7. He was maltreated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led 
to slaughter like an ooh, dumb before those who shear her. He did not open his mouth. This isn't about sheep. This isn't about unblemished lambs. This is about not opening your mouth. That's just, I don't know, metaphor or symbolic of the sheep being led to slaughter. This verse can be identified in the book of Ezekiel. Again, the key to understanding Isaiah 53. God maltreats him, not man. Maltreatment is a part of being chastised and punished by the words and power of God to make, be made suitable for his purpose. With God, you are always submissive. It is necessary to break the will of a man that is going to be the servant of God to temper and calm his soul and emotions. Ezekiel said he went in bitterness and the fury of his spirit in the hand of God. The chastisement, punishment, maltreatment, crushing and bruising in God's fire of refinement is to remove this bitterness and furious nature of Ezekiel. It is to make a man meek and, and humble. Moses was called the most humble man on earth at the end of his life. God had him for 40 years. Ezekiel was sent to his house, and God bound him with the cords of his power so that he could not go out among the people. To the people, Ezekiel was silent as a lamb. He was cut off from society, cut off from the land of the living. Not unlike myself. God told me, go to your room. It's where I've lived for just about 13 years now. Well, it has been 13 years. And cut me off from, from everything. Had me stop practicing law. Had me terminate my law licenses. Um, you know, at my age, and uh, I had been in Hawaii for uh, two years before the colon cancer hit me back in 2001. And um, didn't have a whole lot of friends to stay away from to begin with. And not going to work at my age, you know, those are usually where you have your friends and people you do things with. So that was gone. And uh, my children are all married and they're all living their lives. They, they really don't know what's going on with me because I hadn't said much. I did right in the beginning. Mm, but just big question marks on top of their heads, so to speak. And uh, never really uh, said much about God talking to me uh, after after the initial year, I guess it was, a couple of times. As I said, you know, my, my daughter's uh, in Galveston, Texas. My son uh, is uh, in New Mexico. And uh, my uh, oldest daughter is in San Antonio. That's the best of my recollection right now. We don't talk very much. They, they know I'm not happy or don't believe in, that. I guess that's what it is, Jesus. And they're here in America. They consider themselves Christians. I wouldn't say they were uh, Bible thumpers by any stretch of the imagination, but um, just just saying such a thing here in America uh, will have you ostracized real quick. And uh, I'm sure it's something that Jews are well familiar with, the Jewish people, um, and, and and to indicate that. I believe Judaism is the religion of the three Abrahamic religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Um, by and large, people don't like to hear it here in America. They just don't. That's just the way things are. And I don't see it changing in the Michigan area. 
And if you watch this video, you know I'm very adamant about that. The man who is described and becomes God's righteous servant will be cut off from the land of the living and be silent as the land to all that know him while God prepares him to be suitable for his uh, purpose that might prosper. Just as he did with Ezekiel. Ezekiel, of course, was being made suitable to be a uh, prophet to the exiles. And he was, he was actually a part of the last deportation, I understand. Or at least he was part of the exile. <clears throat> now, Jesus talked until his last breath. In one gospel, Jesus is asked, Are you going to remain silent? And his response was to talk verse after verse after verse after verse after that. That was his answer to, are you going to be silent? No, I'm not. I got plenty to say. And he was never confined to a house, to a room. Um, he was always free to move. He, I was kind of surprised to see oftentimes he and his 12 would stay at a mountain near Jerusalem. Never see that in any kind of movie or anything. Uh, he did not live in Jerusalem. He did have a house. I'll get to that. Verse 8. By oppressive judgment, he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. That would be the people of Isaiah, the Jewish people. Now this is another way of looking at an offering for guilt. The oppressive judgment is being guilty and receiving a sentence of imprisonment in your home or your room. And maltreatment, chastisement, punishment, bruising, and crushing for the sins which causes the guilt of the Jewish people until suitable for God's purpose. Uh, <clears throat> God is, he uses these verses symbolically with the offering for guilt in this verse being shown as a guilty plea before a judge of crimes not committed by the defendant. Ezekiel <clears throat> chapter 3 verse 14. The spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Okay, that would be the jailer for the oppressive judgment. Who can describe his abode and cut off from the land of the living? That's the prison. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 24. And a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And he spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. This is one of those situations God is in his spirit. The Spirit enters into Ezekiel, and in another verse he says, And I could hear God's words. The question becomes, who is it that says, He spoke to me? Well, it's a capital H, so that's God. The Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and God spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. The chains, the chains that you would have and in prison and put on by the jailer, I suppose. As for you, O mortal, cords have been placed upon you, and you have been bound with them, and you shall not go out among them. That's the people. And that's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 25. The judgment against Jesus by Pilate was not guilty. I find nothing wrong with this man. But to wash his hands of the whole religious controversy, Pilate asked the multitude that had gathered, 
And I don't know how many that is, and I don't know if the multitude was just Jews or if it included Arabs and Gentiles. And, well, Arabs are Gentiles, but it, it doesn't tell us. A multitude of gathered, that's all we have. He asked them <clears throat> what they would have him do with Jesus. Release him? No, crucify him. And the multitude said, crucify him. <laughs> that was not an oppressive judgment. It was not a judgment of being taken away or cut off. No, it was a sentence of death. It's, I mean, it, it is oppressive, I grant you. <laughs> but it's a death sentence. This is a sentence that is onerous. Difficult to bear. And you don't receive long life. This man, he, here he has an impressive judgment against him. He had all these words like wounded, bruised, crushed, chastised, punished. But he's given long life. So it's not a death sentence. Who could describe his abode? Jesus has a house in the Gospels, but it is never described. No one today could describe his abode. And Isaiah chapter 11 says that his abode shall be honored, the Messiah, who is described in Isaiah 53. This is the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 15, Holy Bible, King James Version from the internet and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples for there were many and they followed him doesn't sound like shunned and despised to me and of course today nobody can describe that above all of Israel will be able to describe the abode of God's righteous servant, that would be me, in this day of, of social media and phones with cameras, and it will be in Israel, it will be in Jerusalem. Now what does it mean, it is to be honored? I, I don't know what that means, a fancy home, or just the fact that God's righteous servant lives there. Um, for these past 13 years, I've basically been in a room in a condo with my parents. I mean, I pretty much stay in here all the time. I go down to the kitchen every so, you know, once a day, once or twice a day. But um, before that, when I was in Hawaii, we lived in a, just a, I call it the little green shack. I mean, there wasn't anything to it at all. But we, we the, the kids just, they were all over the, I took my oldest and, and daughter and my son initially my young young daughter at the time uh, came out with us too for about a month this is post divorce and uh, my wife had custody of all of them but she didn't want the first two she was getting remarried and they were a handful not unlike their father i've heard that more than once <laughs> but uh they were having a great time it was good for them they needed to get away from houston for a while and that's why i went and, um, but that's, you know, after two years of cancer hit me, I did pass the Hawaii bar. I got the results in the hospital. <laughs> but, uh, and it was difficult to take. I was, I was in enormous pain, but, uh, it had to be done. You know, I, was, I had family to take care of. Through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. Well, Ezekiel suffers the punishment, God tells him, of the houses of Israel and Judah, which is for sins, for 430 days. But the houses of Judah <laughs> and Israel were defeated by the Babylonians and deported. They, they suffered their punishment in exile. God told them, if y'all don't stop, 
I'm going to raise up armies against you. You're going to, yeah. And so they, they suffer their punishment. There's no vicarious suffering in this chapter of Ezekiel. And God makes that clear. Basically he's saying, you're going to suffer the equivalent of what they should suffer. They exiled 430 days, pinned to the ground with your hands tied behind your back in the power of God. I don't know if that's really close, but God thought it was about right. <laughs> Sounds pretty brutal to me. I myself, because because I did something that in retrospect was about, but it shows who I was when God first got to me. As he would say, when people ask you why it took 13 years to get you where I wanted you, or 13 plus years, tell them that story. He won't let me tell many, but he'll let me tell you this one. He's always saying to me, Keith, I am God. <laughs> Particularly early on. And sometimes a lot sterner than that. Well, anyway, he had driven me to almost madness. <laughs> That's how I say it. <laughs> Anger. And, and then I hear, Keith, I am God. And I responded, God, I am Keith. I never did that again. He slammed me to the ground in his power with such force, it just about knocked me unconscious. Kept me there pinned for five days. Now, he did take me on um, visions. As a matter of fact, we were had been going through the Holocaust, many visions of the Holocaust. And the thing about my visions, a great many of them, I'm literally in the vision. I'm part of it. And it's amazing what he can do in a vision with your emotions, your feelings, and your thoughts. But uh, it was a rough five days. And, um, but it went a long way in, in getting me to realize you don't talk like that. He seems like a person. He seems like, you know, your next door neighbor who's invisible that has come over and taken over your house. <laughs> you know, they're like guests. They show up at your door, and they come in, and they tie you up in a chair in the back room. We're going to take over now. We got everything. Don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> or, or the unwanted relatives that show up, and, and you can't get rid of them. You know, and they're driving you crazy sometimes. But that's just the brutality of going through the fire of refinement. But at the end, you know, You're so thankful, you know. I would have never been this man. You know, I could never do the things he's having me do. I watch these videos before I post them, and I'm just like, I could never do that. I was pretty glib, but not not like he has me be. And uh, laughing and smiling, it's just like a, it's just like a different creature sitting there. It's me. I just, it's almost dumbfounded. I'm just, and I'll tell him, man, you, you were something else. When you're, when you're operating me, the unit, <laughs> sometimes I call it. <laughs> anyway, again, he wants you to know these things about him. He, he's not just, everybody, I'm sure, especially those who seriously study the Torah and the time, you have your own perceptions of this entity, God, not as a man, but as a person yourself, you can't help but start adding attributes to him of a man and uh, when he converses with you he says oh one man to another man uh, but it doesn't take long to, to realize this is an entity of being that is nothing like man other than he exists and he does have emotions and he did create everything and of course he relates to me in a way that I can understand is that how he is of his own when it's just him and his companion, the spirit? Probably not. It's different. So anyway, no vicarious suffering. God says every man is responsible for his own sins. And he tells his, his people, do not sacrifice your children. Because there was a there was another there was a false god that, that I, I don't the fire god uh, I can't remember the name right now but um, people would, would, would fire these idols up and 
tossed their babies in as a sacrifice, and the Jewish people were doing it. And he told them, don't sacrifice your children. And what does Christianity say? God sacrificed his child, so we are forgiven of disobeying him. Again, when you make a human sacrifice, it's the main thing. Camera just faded in and out. I may have to cut this short. As the Mayans did, they were looking for favor. They made the sacrifice so their gods would do something for them. What was God making the sacrifice of his child for the Gentiles to do for him? What was he trying to get them to do he couldn't get them to do? What's he looking for? So it's, it, I don't, you know, and they say the Hebrew Bible, the Bible he gave his children, is prophetic of this human sacrifice. And again, Jesus says, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. As I told you, he did away with the system through his prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, Amos, in the Psalms. He said, no more. No more. Don't offer them to me. Stop sinning or I'm going to punish you. And that's what he did. But he didn't ever leave them. He married them. He espoused them. And he tells them, there's, there's one song he said, basically he says, I don't care if every single one of you turn your back to me. I don't care if every single one of you is sinning and not practicing my laws and commandments. I'm not, I'm not leaving you. You're mine. That I will punish you. <laughs> That's God. Verse 9, and his grave was set among the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Now, Jesus was a poor man. He didn't have anything, although he did have a house. I don't have a house. And a um, poor car, or even a bicycle. <laughs> I didn't even have to give him a bicycle. We, I had walked. For 13 years, like I'm in the Exodus. You know, they camped out for almost 20 of those 40 years in front of a dime. Who never would let them pass through. That's what's, I mean, it's, 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 that's just part of the story that God knew he was going to write. That he was coming from a dime. Because, see, he was with Moses. Moses wasn't allowed to go through. That means God didn't go through. Because Moses was a host of the Lord's host. The Spirit that entered him, God was in the Spirit. So God and the Spirit are in Moses, doing what they did with me, controlling everything. You're still yourself. It's not like some possession where, you know, if you watch uh, uh, Supernatural, for instance, uh, these demons will possess somebody and they push that person to the back, almost like they're, they, they, yeah, they're not part of it anymore. That's not what this, it, it, you know, I'm a host and they are guests, so to speak. Uh, and they're very kind of good gifts. They take care of you. They make sure you feel like yourself. They do good things for you. Even though I have to go through this fire refinement, which I'm told <laughs> ends when I get to Neblet, then Gary in the airport in Jerusalem. I can't wait to get there. But, uh, and, and doing work like this. So it's been long periods where I just, you know, when writing was done and it was just, uh, it's just brutal when I don't have work to do for him. Uh, he, you know, he, he said, I can always make you a little bit better. So, and again, you can read about some of, some of this a little bit more graphic in uh, the life of the righteous servant of God in Isaiah 53, which in my life, God had me type. He dictated it. He's my ghostwriter, which is, you know, really... <laughs> That's something else. I mean, it's just a life of getting hurt, <laughs> banged up and suffering. I mean, that's, that's what it's focused on, you, you know. So uh, there's some interesting things in there. Uh, a lot of information, but really for to, to get outside of Isaiah 53 and see other matters of the Bible that aren't ever discussed or whether the knowledge is uh, uh, weak 
like it is with Isaiah 53 today in this teaching of Israel being the, the righteous servant. Um, there's a lot of other material, and there's a lot more on Jesus and his story and the scenes and, and uh, this and that. Uh, probably about seven chapters, and the rest of it is all Judaism, the Jewish people. So anyway, this this verse, uh, and then Jesus is said to, um, after he was entombed, after the crucifixion, they took him, a rich man, donated his grave. That's the story written around what happened. And so they say he fits this verse. You know, but the fact is, he's still poor. <laughs> he just got buried. But, but you know, I, I think it just means because of things like uh, being raised to great heights, uh, a home uh, to be honored, you know, a, a, a really nice home. And... Um, uh, this man receives as his portion the many, that would be the many he makes righteous, and as his spoil, as his spoil, that would be the multitude. And um, presumably, you know, if, if I'm leading those kind of people in these teachings, and that's where, you know, God says, I'm going to, I'm going to dismiss the rabbis and appoint David as a ruler amongst the flock. Well, that, this would be what I do, is, is, is the things that he would have me do, of course, as his servant, but also the matters of the book. This, a teaching of a different end times, the mysteries of heaven, this is nothing I don't know for the most part, or as far as what can be related to other human beings and understandable. So, and, and we know he's a man of suffering and had to rise to great heights. So, and then he's taken from the world. You know, he took me to poverty. So, to me, I read that and, you know, I'm a poor person, but I'm going to end up rich. Verse 10. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And that through him, the Lord's purpose might prosper. But the Lord chose to crush him with disease. And I, I think I've covered that sufficiently. Um, I'm familiar with disease. I hope my life is crushed by disease, by cancer. I was supposed to die 20 years ago. God says, I took it from you. I gave it to you, and I took it. I, <laughs> I gave you cancer, but you survived because of me. I orchestrated you getting shot through the abdomen. You're the man of suffering. A lifetime of it. But I made sure you didn't die. Now, I don't know exactly how he did that. But, uh, you know, possibly he was in the operating room and helped the surgeon's hand. I, I don't know. But it, it was, it was it's very difficult to be shot in the abdomen when, you, when you're 18 years old. It's... Uh, very traumatic, to say the least. Uh, there's little question, I, I had nightmares just about all my life from, from um, seeing things that you just shouldn't see in a household where there's been a number of suicides in the family and uh, as a young child. And, and then the trauma of being shot. Um, and that's what I believe was always causing these, this headache I had. It, I, it was from biting down, was inability to sleep good, nightmares, which is a, a, a byproduct of post-traumatic shock disorder. And that's what I thought my problem was. And I was destroying my jaw joint by all the biting down. 
And as I also just mentioned in the last video, God controls my drink. So that stopped. But he also uh, was causing that pain. He was causing me to do that because, again, I'm the man of suffering. He came to me in the womb to make sure I fit these verses. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's the only proof I can offer you that I actually offered myself for guilt to him. Guilt that was just a test, which I'm about to get to one more time, I'll run through it, because that's novel, that's new, but it all fits. That's the thing about all these teachings in, in Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord and in my book. I mean, once he, once he speaks to me, I mean, the first six or seven chapters are just brief histories of, of accidents I went through and uh, of my life and just kind of a chronology you know i went to school how that happened uh, always getting in trouble leaving home you know the worst and um, you know failing ninth grade barely getting into college i had to go on a, i had to go into summer school the only reason i even went to college is because of that shot it changed and god says well i knew it, how it was going to change you and it did I finally realized, you know, you can't just fool around in this life. I, I need to do something with myself. And uh, because I wasn't going to get out of high school. I, I had just failed too many classes. Uh, mostly because I, I, I just didn't like it. <laughs> well, I wanted to be elsewhere. So I was always skipping school and this and that. And like I said, getting in fights and getting uh, suspended and thrown out. And I got thrown out of one school. Again, another alteration with the principal. I mentioned when in the second grade I had an altercation. And then I had another one in high school and they told me to cut my hair. <laughs> and and uh, I did. You know, I, I, I always wore my hair in a ponytail. It was nice and neat. It was long, long, long way there. And, and I reported to the principal to show him. And you know, he got up out of his desk walked behind me, I'm sitting in a chair, and grabbed me by the back of the head and yanked my head back and said, it's still over your collar. <laughs> I think I did a backflip out of that chair. I'm not sure what happened, but I do know it took several people to pull me off of him. That's how volatile I was. I mean, I think just, God would say, tell him. I said, that's what I had to deal with. That's why I was taking so long. The fury of my spirit. So, um, I, I tell my, you know, David, what can I say? I got some DNA in me that is a little bit different from maybe others. I'm not sure. Again, so far removed, that's why I'm a twig. So far removed as a descendant of David, but uh, anyway. So, and the Lord chose to cross him by disease. Again, he wants that man blemished. He knows the Gentiles are going to come up with the unblemished Lamb of God. He was Leviticus. You sacrifice the Lamb, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> and so they use the human being. And he made sure you can't do that. He said they did it anyway. It's like, it's, it's, I, I don't understand it. How, how can you read crucifixion and the man lives? <laughs> Makes me righteous by his knowledge. Now I know it says might. He might have on it. Might see his children. But that's just part of the test of devotion. That's what it's about. And it's a test because there's nothing to offer yourself for. That's why the angel comes before them. The angel's here before he ever starts teaching me the scripture. And the Jews don't know it, but they're sin free. I, I had to announce it. My book's announced it, by the way. It's another reason I'm probably having trouble getting it published. It's just too much for these the, the publishers or whoever's reviewing the books. They they get they make it to a review and they say, well, it's really not our it's not our thing. That's what it comes out to me. It's not our thing. And I'm like, well, I know, but you need to know that your thing needs an adjustment. And you need to, you, your people that you sell books to need to see it, but uh, to know that. I don't worry about that, because again, it's just God's day. It's, it's his problem. I mean, I already know. He knows it's going to get done, so I don't have to worry about it. 
It's his day. It's his people. It's his temple. He's the one who wants to be back in Jerusalem. His people are back. Great. Great. I want to be part of it. <laughs> but I'm not going to worry about it because I know you're going to do it. You got it. You can say, Mike Prosper, all you want. I'm going to go with, it's going to happen. Somehow, some way. And I also know that my long life is going to be real long because I can tell it's going to take a long time to get all this done. <laughs> That's a good thing, too. Oh, no. And he's promised me. And he knows this is what I want more than anything in the world. An Indian Scout 60 Bobber Blacken. <laughs> Motorcycle. I had a Harley once, and uh, it was my first motorcycle, and I just, I just love rhyming. It's just, not, I just love rhyming. And he's, he's dangling that in front of me, and of course I've been in poverty for 13 years now, and that's, I, I, I don't think about the abode, having money to buy a soda or anything. It's just, I can really get a motorcycle. You gonna let me ride a motorcycle? Uh, as most yet, in, in that kind of. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I will have one in Jerusalem, and I'll get there somehow. So anyway, here's what an offering for guilt is. Uh, Toby Singer, in his Midrash on 53, says that that, that phrase, uh, uh, he offers himself for guilt, means literally, guilt offering, let's go to Leviticus. And he finds that the sixth million that God, he comes up with, God sacrificed the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. Now, it, none of it works. I'm not even going to try to get into that. He's a brilliant man. He's got knowledge from <laughs> sea to sea. You know, he's like an encyclopedia on the Bible. But boy, the reasoning capabilities on that particular verse right here, verse 10, just left him, in my opinion, because Israel is a man, they have to gather as one. See, it all started with the first covenant. All the Israelites gathered into a man, as the man Israel, they agreed to the covenant, saying, we will abide by all of your laws and commandments Moses gives us, which it turns out includes an oral tradition. If you will be our God, and we will be your people. When, when did they ever regather anywhere? Crushed with the disease, or brought to grief with the illness in, in the uh, New Testament, and then and then have long life and make the many branches. See, I mean, it just can't happen. It doesn't happen. And this verse is written because not only is the man blemished. Because God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. He knew what Judaism was going to have. And, and a guilt offering in Leviticus is an unblemished ram. None of these people were unblemished, number one. Number two, who offered them? Did Hitler offer them? He didn't get long life and make the many righteous. Those people didn't get long life and make the many righteous. I don't know what he's thinking. I really don't. But I know he's a good man. And uh, he, he, he practices Judaism to the T, I'm sure, as an Orthodox Jew. But, you know, really. And, of course, as with all rabbis, he's dismissed. He's no longer in right standing with God. But he's got a long way to come back because he's going to have to straighten that out. He needs to get hold of these books, and and I do want it relate to him. That's why I'm saying. Well, that's why God's had me say to it. I want it. Doesn't matter to me either way. I just do what I'm told. I say what I'm told to say. I'm commanded to do it. You don't say no to God. And, and that's another thing about being crushed with cancer. God can come to you, like I said. He just sees Ezekiel, but you're not going to say no to him if he says, "I want you to be my righteous servant and do." Dedicate your life to what I tell you to do. And that includes when you go to sleep and when you wake up. That includes what you eat. That includes when you eat. That includes when I have you exercise. I control everything. You no longer have self-will. You say yes. You go ahead. Yeah. You say, hmm. Okay. 
it's, it's an automatic. So that's what it was for. In verse 10, verse 10 is, is to prevent anybody from saying from the, Jew, uh, from the Jewish side that this could be a man. It can't be a man. Especially cannot be an unblemished lamb, a perfect man. See, I am this man, and I am the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, this is, you can't put us in the same sentence without having the sentence blow up. <laughs> Just, you can't do it. But I don't who fits it. Not a perfect, handsome, beautiful, charming, pleasing, intelligent, sinless. So he says. I don't know. False prophecy. I'm going to come back. He doesn't do it. Is that sin? Is that lying? Is it deceit? Um, but this this whole Zechariah thing, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride into Jerusalem on an ass that's over the prophet say of me, I shall be mocked, spit on, scourged, killed, and rise on the third day. And yet and yet the prophecy says the man will ride it and ask into Jerusalem, and the next verse says it's summed up defeat wrong. In his time, today it would be throw the Palestinians out of Israel, get them out of there, make them go to Georgia. So that's it. We're not having them. You're not going to keep launching bombs at us. You're not going to live inside our land. This is God's land. You can't come in here and possess it. You can't adversely possess it. To God, you're the trespassers. That's what he would call you. That's what he does call you. I don't want those trespassers in my land. I want my temple on the Temple Mount. And he said, I don't care about the mosque. I ain't care about our synagogues. As though I gotta have an excuse and I don't. I guess the feeling. If we weren't in the modern era of <laughs> satellites and television and social media, that he'd just say, you know, drive them into the sea. And their families. Just just like the promised land with the Israelites. Drive them into the sea. Kill them all. Take the women and children. Take their stuff. And take their animals and drive them into the sea. Just be done with them. See, he's not a human being. <laughs> he is a being that has a whole different agenda and idea about everything. And of course, I live learning his perspective on things. And and I get it. It takes a while, but you do get it. This <laughs> he just has a different way of thinking. So uh, but you know, of course I love it, it's great. So anyway, who could just, let me get back to where I was and finish up. The speaker of verses 11 and 12 is God, and I'll pick that up on another video. And, and in my, um, basically my video midrash on Isaiah 53. I think I've covered just about everything. So anyway, well, the, it's uh, passing the test of devotion. is when I really started learning about a host and a man to buy bands. I didn't, I didn't understand the con I mean, he hadn't even taught it to me. I don't think I really got it until we were actually writing uh, the book, putting chapters together and adding new material. But, you know, it's one God of Israel, one angel of his presence, and one man, Hushiah, the anointed one. In this case, me. At one time, it, it, it was, you know, any of the prophets that wrote for him, Moses. I mean, and, and there's some stories. God left little hints in the Torah that, that the scholars of the Torah and the Talmud will, will be surprised. And I'll rely just a little bit to, uh, to, to back up some of the things I say. Uh, things that had to do with that bright white face he had when he came back down the mountain the second time. What that was about and uh, his attendant. 
Joshua. Uh, and that was, that's, that's the name that Moses gave him. That's, that's not his original name. And it wasn't his name at the time that he was following Moses up the mountain and living in his tent with Moses. And then after, after the bright white face that he had to cover up, the attendant disappeared. He's, he's just like, Moses come down the mountain and he's not waiting on him. And he's not in the tent. Then he, he would stay in the tent when Moses left. You know who he represents? The angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Holy God. And that it, that that's the symbolic, you, you are now a sinless person. And that would be me. I can't sin. I don't even have self-will. I can't even, <laughs> you know. God controls me now. And, you know, it's just fine. I'm old. I don't want to do any sins. I've had my wild days. I told God, God said, uh, you know, we got to this part, verse 12, he's a sinner. I said, you know, I never really thought of myself that, of that much of a sinner. I was, a, I was good to other people. And, uh, you know, I tried to do the right thing. Didn't really know anything about Ten Commandments or anything else. I've seen the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, of course, everybody has. And uh, he, he said, you, you don't think you measure the center, huh? And all of a sudden, I'm Scrooge in, in that story. You know, Christmas, the, the ghost of Christmas past is taking me on visions. And in these visions, it's like I'm back there. You know, it's, it, it, it's like the first time you start a car. You know, you can remember, man, I'm, I felt so great the first time I drove a car, you know, when you But you can't really get that feeling back. He puts it back in me. I can literally feel as I did the moment I first started and drove a car. The excitement, the ambience that was around me at the time, everything. And it's absolutely amazing. But I also found out it was quite the center. But I wasn't an habitual center of, of any particular type of sin. It just seemed like I hit him, <laughs> hit just about all of them. And as the Christian says, if you've had murder in your heart, you're a murderer. Okay, well, I even caught that one because it is, I was, I get so angry sometimes. It was like, hold me back. This is it. Where's my guns? <laughs> no, I never killed anybody. I, 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 I I don't even hunt. I never hunt. I, I can't. I can't even kill an animal. I don't even like sitting on a bug. And I never have. It's always been me. But again, he's been with me. There's little things about my personality that uh, that that made me a better person without me knowing it. But without any particular extreme, I don't know who I'd have been if he hadn't come to me in my first year. I don't know. Uh, I'm just. It's something that we've been working on more lately than any other time in the last 13 years. You know, uh, and I tell you, it doesn't really matter to me. To me, I'm just me. Uh, my disfigurement, that's just me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me that you say you did it. And I believe him. I said, you know, he did. Uh, it, you know, I loved running, and it really hindered me in track because you need two strong arms for a quick start. To drive out of the box and everything, and um, but the, but one thing that never happened was just surprising because he said part of the reason I did it is so that people would pick on you and and bully you and this and that because that's what happens to young Jewish people. I wanted you to feel as best I could the suffering of the Jewish people in every way imaginable, including the wounding, the crushing, the bruising, uh, the maltreatment. And, um, but the, the fact is, nobody ever made fun of me about this arm. And it could have been I looked like, because I wouldn't smile, and it's like, <laughs> I had a friend tell me, it looks like you, you, when you look at people like you want them to say something bad, so you can launch into them. And maybe that's why. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, he's, he's changed. I'm not that person. Not that person. <laughs> it did take him 13 years, which I think is a little ridiculous. Personally, I, I always say, look, more power, less suffer. What is wrong with that? He said, P, I am God. I decide these things. I decide how long it takes. I know what you need. I know where you have to be. And I say, you're not where I want you. 
And I just say, 13 years is all I got to say. <laughs> all of a sudden, I feel my, my foot getting crushed with the invisible hand. One of his favorite ways to wake me up sometimes. The invisible hand is just grabbing your feet in a deep sleep. And, you know, I come up and I utter his favorite phrase for me. What is wrong with you? <laughs> he makes him laugh. He says, that wrong with me, I'm God. Morning, God, and the day begins. It's not always like that. I think I'm done. I mean, I have a lot of things written, but I've covered them through all these videos, one way or another. Okay, you see, this is the last of the verses by Isaiah. Uh, the third and last speaker is the Lord in verses uh, 11 and 12, and I'll pick those up in, a, in a, another, in the last video on this um, Midrash of Isaiah 53 on camera. I, I, I hope you take these serious. It's a serious business. We're talking about destruction to the land of Israel. They say, that's what I think of. And of course, he puts these thoughts in me and to make me feel like it's actually my responsibility. If no, I know better. It's not my responsibility because I don't control anything. These, but I still feel it. Just like I still feel like me when I know he's having me say words that I wouldn't be saying. Um, it's very complicated. And it does take a long time. Yeah. And I do it again, even if I didn't have this wonderful task in front of me. I mean, to go to Israel, to know, you know, I'll, I'll be able to earn a living again and, and have things and help people understand his personality and, and be instrumental in having the temple built someday. Could be 20 years from now. I'm 63. Moses was, was 80. When God spoke to me, meant to be 120. I don't want to be 120. But, uh, you know, is that story? <laughs> or was he really 60 and lived to be 100? You never know with God. He throws a lot of stuff into his stories, but the fact is, though, everything happened on the ground. It's, it's kind of like you see a movie and it says, based on true story. You know, because God said, you know, it's like the dialogue. He said, if you heard the way they talk to each other sometimes, he said, in the Bible, it might say, and Jacob said, yeah, or Saul said, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> or Saul said, no. And uh, it may have been a gesture. God said, okay, yeah, Saul said, no. Because <laughs> if you read the dialogues, they're all the same throughout the book. <laughs> yeah, and it's like third grade reader. You know, it's very proper, very clean, very... <laughs> and God said, you know, I, I, these books have to sell. <laughs> they have to get around. I have to add some story to it to make it interesting, but I put in my philosophy, the moralities. There's, there's so much behind it. And that's why the Jewish people study Torah so hard. And Torah is like an, almost an entity to them that God created before he created uh, the, the planet, Earth, people. And he did, but what they need to know is, it's not just the Torah he had written. It's the entire Hebrew Bible that he had before creation. The entirety, even the Psalms, he had written. Now he writes them in antiquity, so they read as though they come from antiquity. But, you know, he's talking to his father. Isaiah wrote Isaiah. That's what he told me to think about. He says, sometimes I had to get other people to finish or do this, or do that. He said, but when you read it, understand that while there is a lot of story, I could have made any of it happen. All of them are within my powers, all stories. And I'm not talking about express miracles like in the Exodus, where he, he flat out says he's done it. But it's like you see Elijah, and you know, he's calling down the fire at the sacrifice of the bulls with the... <clears throat> with uh, everybody in Jerusalem having come outside to watch it all with the uh, <laughs> bad guys. I can't remember the name right now. He's not giving it to me. 
You'd be, you know, you think if God's controlling you, you'd be a perfect person. You'd be like a Jesus. No, I'm still king. You listen, I'm still me. No, I can't sin, but uh, I can still, you know, I can argue and get angry and uh, nothing like you would think of Jesus, so to speak. And he, he's not part of this, you know. Uh, there's nothing written about him in his time. And everything was a story back then. It's a great story. And like I said, there's all kinds of variations to it. And the fact is, I don't believe he ever existed. And I have it on good authority. He didn't. I'm the Moshiach, and I bring God's wrath. And I bring his reckoning. We'll finish up with what God has to say, or let him film another video. I can't believe he's had to say that. That's from God himself. The Lord said, and what I just said, yeah, that's how it works. You just did it. Thank you, y'all. Everybody have a good day. The Lipper Scholar versus Jesus in Isaiah 53, verse 11. The speaker is God. Out of his anguish, he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. My righteous servant makes the many righteous, it is their punishment that he bears. That would be the same as Ezekiel. He bore the punishment of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which was part of God's fire of refinement in preparing him to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylon, Babylonian exiles. This reference to his uh, devotion is to chapter 11, verse 2 of Isaiah, where one of the attributes of the Spirit that alights upon the Anointed One, Hushiach, is a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. The anguish is the emotional and physical pain. <clears throat> Ezekiel, for instance, suffered by punishment and the power of God to be made suitable for his purpose, which in my case might prosper. God's righteous servant, that is the Moshiach and myself, when I come out of God's fire of refinement and the anguish of it, and there's been plenty, I am very devoted to God. I'm devoted to the Jewish people. I'm devoted to the country of Israel. This is this is my whole world, my whole focus, as though this is why I was born. As the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. It says that he will make the many righteous by his knowledge. Knowledge, a Gentile such as myself, must be taught not only of the scripture, but of the Jewish people and their history, the Middle East, Israel's government, and just anything and everything that I might need to know. Abraham, a stranger in a strange land of a strange language, That's a repeat for me. And just as Ezekiel was given knowledge in his fire refinement, and this is where you find it, it's in, um, no, I don't have the chapter. God said to Ezekiel, mortal, eat what is offered you, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. It's teaching him what he needs to go and tell them. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. He said to me, mortal, feed your stomach and fill your belly with this scroll that I give you. I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey. And he said to me, mortal, go to the house of Israel and repeat my very words to them. Now we hand this, which means 
he also told Ezekiel, get some parchment and a stylus and write this down. Because if he had just said it to Ezekiel and he went and talked to the house of Israel, we don't have an account of it. Now, Jesus did not come out of his anguish to make the many righteous through his devotion to God. And that's what this verse says. His anguish ended in death. He asked God on the cross why God had forsaken him and then he died. God's righteous servant is a man of pain, suffering, and wounds throughout his life grievously affected especially by disease and severely injured at one time or another as though plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. These are the qualities, if you will, that identify me as God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. That in the fact I was supposed to die 20 years ago but for God removing lung cancer from me, lung cancer that he crushed me with himself. He gave me lung cancer, but he kept me alive, and then he removed it, and now I have long life to accomplish all these tasks before me, the task of Elijah, the task of the prophet like Moses, the task of David, the task of the righteous servant. They all go together. He spent 13 years preparing me. As he said, I don't need four different people, and I don't need to try to train up four different people. You see, he never leaves me. He's never gone. His spirit entered into me. God is in his spirit. They do not leave. He always tells me, if we let you drop dead, and I don't know why that is, he won't tell me. You know, he, there's a lot of things he won't tell me, by the way. But... Um, It's, it's this life that I led that has prepared me for this. I've been down low, and I've been up high, practicing law. Uh, I've been thrown out of schools. I failed ninth grade. Uh, you see, you know, I, I, I've run the gamut with the, and with different peoples, and I've been in poverty for 13 years. We walk all the time. I see who lives out there. I see the people that live on the streets. I talk to them, and. Um, I was a fighter. I'm sure David was. He doesn't really come across it, but here's a man, when he was in exile, when, when he went to the uh, Philistines for a couple of years, it said that he went out and killed enemies of God every single day. And then he, and, and he killed the women too, because they might kill him. <laughs> now there's a day that you don't usually factor into your thoughts. But the amazing part of that is, the miraculous part is, he's never hurt. He never got hurt. Now, you go jump into a nest of savage men and kill them all, and you do it every day for a year and a half, you figure somewhere along the line, you're going to at least get hit in the head with a rock. Something's going to happen. But no, see, God was with him. So he had a fiery nature, and so did Moses. In his anger, he killed the man. Ezekiel, who you never would think of it, he says, when God took, Spirit entered him, God was in him, and God started his fire of refinement. Ezekiel said, I went in bitterness and in the fury of my spirit. So, that's just part of the problem. Now, I don't know about Isaiah. He seems uh, like he didn't have the same type of issues with his uh, furious spirit. And if you go to Ezekiel, God goes out of his way to say, I know that those who do not revere my name, say my name, have been talking about me. <laughs> this and that. And he says, and I've heard them. And he said, and I know there's many who do who are going to see my name. And for this day, I'm preparing a roll of remembrance, scroll of remembrance. And that would be for those who sing his name, revere him, which means heed him. 
And that's what's written into the covenant of Jeremiah 31. But there he said, when I forgive your sins, that will make, of course, Torah written on your heart, which I've explained. That just means a lot of people are going to come back or start into Judaism and put a better effort towards learning the Torah. And, and that's, it's just a metaphor, and that's what it's meant. And he also shows us here that it's not going to be everybody. In the covenant, he says, and all shall heed me. Well, that's what you would expect. You know, or from God's perspective, if I forgive everybody's sin, of course I would expect everybody to heed me. But the fact is, I know better. That's what he would tell you. I know better. I know people. I made people. And you know, there's so many people that will never believe a word I say. There's atheists. There's... You know, there's religious people, and they are set in their beliefs. Anybody who says Messianic era isn't going to happen should, you know, uh, not be listening to. <laughs> so those, and so what is he talking about there? He talks about, he says, those who hear and revere me will be like uh, calf-fed, uh, saw-fed calves who will, will stomp on the ashes of those who do not heed the Lord. And basically, it's an antiquity where it's, it's verses for antiquity and today, he's basically talking about heaven. And that's something I haven't, I don't believe in all these videos. And of course, this is the last one for Isaiah 53. That, okay, I'm going to go forward first. I think I might run across it here in, in my notes. Again, I'm reading from my Midrash on Isaiah 53 and from the writings in the two books that God dictated to me. This is how he says it in Malachi. He says, the Lord has not heard it and noted it. And a scroll of remembrance has been written at his behest concerning those who revered the Lord and have seen his name. And on the day that I am preparing said the Lord of hosts, they shall be my treasured possession. I will be tender toward them as a man is tender toward a son who ministers to him. And he tells me that's his reference. If I'm going to be tender to people, it's going to be in heaven. That's just how I am. And that's what, and, and if you, you love as, you know, as to your son, this and that, you would want them to go to heaven. But that's what it's for. God says that he, he might elaborate on that for me at some future time. But that, that's what it says. A man who is tender towards his son, the minister to him, is a man who never wants to be without him. He's going to want him with him. And, of course, he dictated that to me about two years ago. <laughs> for behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. Now here's God calling Jerusalem heaven. Okay, why? Because in antiquity, they didn't think about a spiritual heaven. The, the concept of living with the angry God <laughs> it's always right, raising the sword against you and the harshness of life. It, 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 you know, that's why they believed in a resurrection. But in Ezekiel, God shows you his spiritual heaven. It's in verses 1 and 10. Now, he also shows you for, for antiquity, chapter 37, rise, old bones, rise. A resurrection chapter with Ezekiel. But in chapter 1, you see this wheel works. These four wheels that the wheels in was that can turn by themselves, this and that, and the spirit is in the wheels, it says. And I love that. And moving with the wheels are four creatures with six wings. And in chapter 10, he says, oh, it's the same wheel works. It's, it's the same vision, except 
This time he calls them cherubim, which are the angels that are on the ark. You've all seen a picture of that. For as the new heaven, oh, back to that. How is that spiritual heaven? It's the eyes. I'm out for a while, but I haven't read chat, uh, Ezekiel yet at this point in time, some, some years back. And God and I have walked up to the city park. It's a beautiful park, a memorial park. And it's got a three mile running loop, golf course, it's got everything. Trees everywhere, paths, railroad trains cross through it. And uh, he had, you know, let me go out there and get some exercise and get out of the house. And so I'm talking to him after I ran, I'm sitting under a tree in some shade getting some, getting cool. And we were discussing whether or not I was going to jog home from there, another two miles, or, or we were going to walk. We, you know, we just chit chat. And all of a sudden, I'm in a galaxy. It's a vision, but it's so real. I mean, it's like it's actually happening. I'm in the galaxy seeing the most amazing sights I've ever seen in my life. And this is a vision in spirit as opposed to a vision in body where you're in your body. <laughs> you recognize yourself. The spirit, you can't see. And I'm looking out, looking out, and all of a sudden I realize there's no legs, no arms. There's nothing there. It's just me, and I felt like a pair of eyes. So that night, he tells me, this is how he taught me. So that night, he says, read uh, Ezekiel 1 and 10. The minute I saw the eyes being gathered into the wheels and on the angels, I said, that's the spirits of the Jewish people. It's going to and fro throughout the land. And then in 10, in 10, these, these cherubim, fucking those wings are covered with eyes. The wheels are covered with eyes. And they lift up to the, to, to the platform of heaven, to God's house, the east gate of God's house, God's house, heaven. And God is there. <laughs> and there's a vision, a visage of his throne. Okay, it's a spiritual heaven. He's picking up the Jews, the spirits, and taking them up. And, and, and he told me the wheels represents those who died in a diaspora. Whereas the eyes upon the creatures or the cherubim represent those living in Israel. It's just the wheels indicate he had to go get them. That's all. So there's a spiritual heaven, and yet, but it, well, anyway, I'm not going to go back into the resurrection. It's just, uh, you don't want it to happen. It would destroy Israel. What are you going to do with, with the savage slave Israelites? What are you going to do with those people? God says, run. That's what you do. Get out of there. I said, why well, don't we just send them towards the Palestinians and use them to drive them over to Jordan where they belong? For as the new heaven and the new earth which I shall make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. You know what the new heaven is? It's when all these spirits of the Jews rise up and now they're angelic. Now they're angelic. They won't have wings. But you're angels. So God is adding a brand new host of angels to his heaven. The angels Israel. That's what that's all about. He's taking me there in visions. I've been to the very room I'll have. I've seen the meeting room. And I've seen the entertainment. Now, you're a different being. And I'll get to that. Where he says, you will never remember the things of before. And that before you pray, I will answer. I have the answers to those. And I think that's too detailed for, for, for what I'm doing right here. And I need to move on. But against the last tape, and I wanted to make sure this was clear. In the scroll of remembrance, that's what's being talked about being entered during the day of the Lord because everybody's sin free. Now, I mean, that's how you know it's going to be different because everybody starts even. And now my job as Elijah and as the righteous servant is bring the Jewish families back to the sin of God. Those who are straight, those who never came, those who have found Jesus in their Judaism. No, 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 no. 
No Jesus in the Judaism. That doesn't work. That never works. And that's bringing a false God before God's face. And you really, really don't want to do that. Not that there's a, a hell. Jesus doesn't believe in it. Although I have to say, and I'm questioning him on this, Isaiah in 64, 65 has got one hint in an account that sounds like hell to me. But God said, no, nah, that was just for antiquity. I don't have a hell. I don't bother with those kind of things. So there's no worries, but you don't want to miss it. Here's the entertainment. He says, I'm building a new heaven, the angels Israel, a new host, and a new earth. So, I mean, that tells you what we most of us already know. The judgment day doesn't come until this world's done. And then he's going to, they say, the souls of all men are in God's hand. He's going to raise those angels up then. But the guy being like Sandy, he, unlike Christians, he, he's not taking murderers and wife beaters and child molesters, you know, even though they're sin free. Uh, in Christianity, except Jesus becomes sin free, and it doesn't matter what you've done. You go to Jesus. Well, that's what right standing is about. You know, you've heard me say it on these videos. You've got to be in right standing. I mean, you've got to be a decent person if you're going to be in God's head. But, you know, that's going to, that's going to be an awful lot of people. And uh, he said, to you, wait on that. So, Verse 12, Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his full. For he exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. Okay, if you watch these videos, you, you already know how this works out. Exposed himself to death. God crushed me with disease. I was exposed to death. He started that tumor by orchestrating me being shot through the abdomen. He, 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 for the longest time, I believe, when they told me, when they, they got that tumor out 20 years later, they said, this tumor's been growing for 20 years. And I backdated it to being just about the year I was gunshot. And I did a lot of research, and I found there are theories, but it's really not proven, that traumatic shock to your internal organs can activate dormant cancer cells. And God says, it is true, but I had to use my power, too. And he said, and again, it's just more suffering. It's more scars and bruises. It's just what your life's been about for what I am giving you. And uh, a greater gift you cannot receive. I think everybody would agree with me on that who believed in God. I don't know about atheists. You couldn't talk to me. If he hadn't literally spoken to me, I don't, I would never believe in God. And so, there's a lot of people who said, Keith, do you know how many things you have survived and lived? You know, four times birth, gunshot, colon cancer, lung cancer. <laughs> how can you not believe in God? I said, he just won't come to me. I even told God, and I know how hard all this is to believe, and I'll give you a good example. Two years into this five or five, virtually living with God and His Spirit, and all kinds of things happening, he, he, he kept me almost like on an adventure because He can control my perceptions, my judgments. That would be Isaiah chapter 11, I think it's verse 3. He, 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 will not, he will not make judgments and decisions based on what his eyes perceive and his ears hear. See, he does that for me. I, I, again, I don't make any decisions anyway. He controls it all, but there it is in the chapter and a, a better understanding of what that means. And um, Carry on. Okay. I don't know where that was going. Somebody needs to. Oh, that's what he got. Somebody needs to, to, to contact me someday and say, uh, you know, in this video, you probably have to tell me something I wanted to hear. 
and as we, as me and the spirit call, call it, because it happens at the end sometimes too. God just wipes your mind. He's just, you go into basically a state of awareness. I'm just, you know, I'm here and there's nothing happening. Just, you know, you can't, you can't muster up a thought. You can't even say to yourself, hey, I'm not thinking. You can't even do that. And that has to do with heaven. In heaven, you don't have a mind anymore. Spirit is so complicated. You know, your mind is just a little electricity, chemicals, different tissue of the brain. That's not who you are. That's, that's not where your thoughts are. That's where your thoughts come from. Your spirit is your person. Your spirit reads that stuff in your brain. It reads this information coming in through your eyes and your ears in the forms of electricity, chemicals, and synapses, and <clears throat> things like that. And this is going to go back to, before you pray, I will answer. In heaven, you become like me. God provides the information of your mind. Okay, but now mine's much more detailed. And, but it's not as detailed as the Holy Spirit. But he's been with me my entire life. And um, so he can provide more knowledge of me um, than he does all the, you know, seven, 14 million Jews in the world, whatever the number is. I know there's about 7 million in Israel and 7 million in America, but I don't know how many are in Europe or, or this or that. And um, he is. And, he's, and so I... I, he is proving to me that here on the earth, what it's like not to have your mind in heaven. And he can do it. And he can do it with all the angels. Now, there's a process to it, and it's, it gets a little bit more complicated. But this is for the Jews. This is what he's doing. It's not the Messianic age of the world to come. It's just simply not. And I've tried to explain that as, as best I can with him leading me. On the way. He's leaping me in all these videos. And he, you know, I have it all, my writings down. He tells me, okay, go, go here, go there, pace that. <laughs> now, okay, now this is still recording. And so, you know, I'm just a servant. It's just like, okay. And yeah, that's what I say all the time. Okay, okay. And sometimes I'm trying to say, okay, and he's already lifted me up, and I'm walking to go do what he wants, and I don't even know what it is yet. That's how much he can control me. <laughs> he doesn't even have to, doesn't have to tell me anything. I'll just go do it. That's the kind of control I'm talking about. But he can be your mind. And that's why before you pray, he can answer. It's because he's the one putting it into your mind to think, I'm going to pray. <laughs> so he already knows. But it's, it's real complicated, but uh, as you might imagine. But he can do it. As many people as he can get into that scroll for a special heaven. Because heaven is so much of the mind. It's like the realest vision you could ever have. And, I, and now he, I got that finished. He's picking back up with the entertainment in heaven. He's building a new world. He told me, he says, I'm in this room. He's got a bed, a table, a lamp. It's real, real sparse, kind of like where Elijah stayed at one time uh, in his stories. He says, go to that bay window. And a bay window is, you know, you have a square room, but it, 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 it put, it's, it's outside of the room. It's like, a, it's like a porch, but, you know, it's got uh, glass all around it. But you can see out. He says, look down. And I looked down, and I saw the earth in chaos, just like reading Genesis. He is starting it up. That's it. And in heaven, everything's different. You're a different creature, but you're you. And the, the whole idea of what it means with you won't remember the things of before, God says, look, the Holocaust people don't want to remember the Holocaust. I said, well, how are they going to, you're building a Jewish heaven, how is everybody going to know they're Jews if they don't remember being a Jew in heaven? And then he showed me how. And you won't wonder, why do I know all these things about Jewish people and myself as a Jew? And that'll be it. He won't let you wonder. Your mind just goes to another 
She's going to him. He says, I'll take care of that. That's easy. He says, okay, my camera stops at a half an hour, so picking back up. I was talking about the world. God's going to choose the people again. He's going to basically do the same thing. They won't necessarily be called Hebrews and Jews, and you'll have different characters and names. But you're going to see how the history of the Jews played out. And, of course, you see the creation of the first human being, what the people were really like at this time. And uh, it's going to be really interesting, really interesting. And, uh, and that, like I said, there's meeting places. And so... He, he, you know, God gave me an amendment, be mindful, which, uh, so everybody to decide and be debated by the leaders of the different Jewish religious movements, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, conservative, reform, I don't know if they'll ever win now, <laughs> but uh, they don't believe in the coming of the Moshiach, I don't even think conservative does, and uh, they're wrong, they're wrong, but everybody's wrong about when he comes, there's going to be a messianic era. Not as it's, it's taught, what you have is the day of the Lord, the times of the Messiah, the anointed one, in the awesome, cheerful time of the Lord. And we're going to keep right. Once once this thing busts open, and I'm just going to assume God, will, God knows what he's doing, and we're going to end up there, uh, and I'll continue to write books of you know, maturing, aging, uh, even more, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, dealings with the government and uh, helping out here and there. It says that uh, these nations are startled and kings who are silenced. I think it's, I, I'm not sure if it's chapter 11, but they're going to they're gonna start coming to me for, to, to, for answers, like kind of like a Solomon, knowing that it's not me, Keith McCarty. But actually coming to the belief that, in fact, the God of humanity, that who is, has chosen the Jews as his, uh, is with me. I mean, that, that's, that's, it's not I have to praise him or anything. He's within me. Now, he's without me, too. But, you know, from my perspective, he's just in me with, with his spirit. There's the three of us. It's the man and divine beings, which God withheld from the Torah. He didn't want you to know. It's my proof. Just to have this knowledge and to be able to point to so many different places in the Hebrew Bible and say, well, look, that's what this means. And nobody nobody even knew what it was to question it. And this is how he, you know, back in biblical times, he communicated and had this book, his book, the one the Christians took from him, told you you don't know how to read it, that you don't see the prophecy of Jesus Christ and human sacrifice and his description, Isaiah 53. This man of suffering who's the kind of plague smitten and afflicted. What? You know, I, I was on the internet reading articles at one time and I saw an, uh, a writing by a uh, Catholic of the cloth. And he said, well, we know that he doesn't fit every verse, but who else can it be? I said, I said what's with these people? Because it's, it's, it's a script. you got to match all the verses or you're not him. You know, religious, you know, you get this belief and then that's it. And common sense, reason, and your intelligence don't get in the way. And I guess that's what belief is. You know, <laughs> God wanted me to be an atheist, by the way, <laughs> not very much of a religious person. Uh, and like in heaven, he, he can form your thoughts. You, you'll, you'll still feel like it's you thinking. But there's so much to that. You know, it's taken me 13 years to get to as accomplished as, as I am. And just being around people, I've always been pretty much of a loner, but, you know, in this, this role, uh, and I, I feel like I'm more than ready for it. I'm going to have to be around people. I'm going to have to speak in front of, of groups, large groups of people. I'm not used to that. Uh, even this is, you know, talking on a camera and posting it to the uh, to YouTube. That's 
really doesn't bother me at all. He's, he has shaped my emotions and calmed and tempered them in, in the real by wounding and crushing and bruising and punishment and maltreatment, but more so in his power. Um, it's an incredible feeling. I mean, I can feel it going through me. I can feel it like a pillow when I'm angry, just just the anger just goes away. You know, and he, I mean, listen, God can make you angry. Now I miss you, and I've begged for death a thousand times, and I cursed him a thousand times. I promise you, he can get anybody to curse. It doesn't take, it doesn't take long at all. And he can control your thoughts anyway. He can make you curse him just to make you feel better. <laughs> anyway, verse 12. Anyway, there, there's an entertainment meeting. Uh, it's Jewish heaven, and, and, and what he's going to keep your mind focused on is Judaism. I know this This is my other hook in the water. I got an amendment to be mindful, so to tell people you don't have to be quite so fanatical. If you had to go to work on Saturday, but you've been doing everything, you're reading, you're doing Shabbat, you're not working on Saturday, you're following the old tradition for all these things, but suddenly, this, this would be mine. This is what I would say if I was on a panel debating this with the other religious movements. I would say, it would be okay for me to go to work, but immediately, I need to find another job. Because God knows I'm being observant, but he also knows, you know, I have children, I have a house note, I have car notes. You know, I can't just lose my job at, at a whim. And he would understand. That, that's what you got to do. I mean, you just got to say, he would understand. I am being more than mine. That would be my idea, but it's for everybody to decide of themselves. You know, you claim, you know, everybody's forgive me, you got to claim your slave. And as Elijah, I'm supposed to recounsel the, the Jewish families back to Judaism. And that's what I'm doing in, in these videos and in the books. Come back. Respect God. He doesn't remember anything you've ever done before that's wrong. Don't let, as Judaism teaches, the evil inclination get hold of you. I don't know if it's something that makes me laugh. And, uh, and uh, you know, practice Judaism. Come back. He's here. And, and look at the proof that you have. You have a Moses in your midst. Because I can't know these things. My words have to be true. And lurking behind all that, hopefully he's People say, okay, I want to just take a chance on this and, and try to believe. Oh, that's another story. I'm, the, I'm all over the place today. Anyway, come back to Judaism. Keep the slate clean. Get into the scroll of the mirrors. Be in right standing. And uh, uh, for the rabbis, that means you got to correct your teachings on the Messianic era. Read the books that God had me type. Start teaching the matters in it and the things that you hear on these videos about about how God communicates with the world. He's in his spirit. A man in divine beings is not an angel. Uh, it's a man with a task. It can be limited or it can be great. You know, Moses, great. My task, great. You know, it's just all encompassing until I die. They're not going to leave me. If you ever see me, you can hit, you can bunk your friend and say, hey, I know where God is. You say, what are you talking about? I know where God is. Where's that? See that guy over there? He's all around him. Wherever he goes, God goes. Wherever Moses went, God goes. That's how he walked amongst the tents of the Israelites. <laughs> you know, it was Moses walking by. God's spirit was in him, and God's in the spirit, and he's sitting there talking to Moses. We need to check these guys out in this tent. We need to talk to the leader of this group. Let's go over here. Yeah, and, you know, with Moses, you just, his whole, he, I, there's no reason for me to believe it's any different for him than me. And um, it's an incredible thing, you know, I say it went through, look at the book he wrote. It is not easy working for God. He, as I mentioned, <laughs> my first draft of Isaiah 53, he irritated me so bad. Things, these little things, you know, uh, I'll delete those side pages. I said, I worked two days on those five pages. He said, yeah, I know, but I decided I don't want to. Anyway, I ended up trying to throw the computer out of the window. 
he really wants to, but I was so mad. I think I would have even let me, but my arms wouldn't move. <laughs> the power he had all around me and through me. But uh, I think that I think that's right too. The things I've been talking about. Verse 12, Assuredly I will give him the many as his portion, for he exposed himself to death. And again, you know, I had the cancer, he was behind it, he crushed me with cancer, I had bullet wounds, and so my portion is the many, and that means the people who made righteous don't follow me because he's going to appoint me a ruler amongst the flock, and then they become a multitude, and I hope it's a lot more, I, I hope it's the largest multitude anybody ever saw. I hope somebody says, that's not a multitude, that's a mom. <laughs> that's, you know, whatever it turns out to be. And I hope to make a living this way, writing and um, uh, speaking, synagogues, seminars, uh, groups, just groups in general, big groups, small groups, you know, just say donate what you can or what you will or what you feel good about. We need it. Um, <laughs> anyway. This is we. I'm not going to get God to Israel if I don't get money. If I don't get these books off it. And I tell you, I joke about it. And, you know, I'll get a series of cancer. God, listen, I know you want to be in Israel. I know you're tired of Texas. I said, and just as soon as I can get some money, I'm going to take you there. <laughs> it makes the spirit laugh. He's you know, always making me laugh. Yeah, I said, I'll take you there. I'll get you there, God. It's okay. I said, now, now we could we could take the fast forward on that and go to Vegas, what do you say? He said, you know, I won't do something like that. I said, come on, it's just a roulette ball freezer. You know, let's play a little blackjack, you know, and tell me what the other cards are. We'll clean up. We'll be in Israel overnight. He said, keep. <laughs> anyway, he won't do things like that. <laughs> That's him making faces with my head and my eye. I don't even know what they're doing. So those are the witnesses. Those are the men in the multitude, and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, followers, not, not necessarily on social media, but and I exposed myself to death and disease and almost died from the blood when I should have. He kept me alive. You know, I, I said I did. I was holding on. No, he wasn't going to let me. He wasn't going to let me go, but it was, you know, I didn't know him at the time. And it, it was a brutal experience. I was 18. Numbered among the sinners. Now, I've already gone over that. The, the, the Christians say, oh, that doesn't mean he was a sinner. He's the unborn slain of God. That's because he got crucified with a man to his left who was a sinner and a man to the right who was a sinner. So therefore, he's kind of a sinner. One, two, three. <laughs> they don't say one, two, three. I bet. That's not what it's saying. It's not what it's saying. That's a sinner. And so, having gone through all these verses, I have shown that he doesn't fit one of them. Not one. He doesn't fit them. It's not a man of suffering. He wept one time. And he suffered one day. And it was a big suffering, I'll give you that. But I mean, yeah. That's not the life I, it's not descriptive. Thousands upon thousands of people were being scourged and, and, and crucified. He didn't tell you anything. These verses are just identify a person. Crushed with cancer, exposed to death. Jesus wasn't exposed to death. He died. Exposure is you got real close to it. Just not him. And, anyway. And Pete, you know, the man is believed in human life, but I, I can't get off this. I mean, at least they got it. You offer the sacrifice of God hoping to get favor. What favor does he want from the Gentile? When he offers his son up, what is the favor to him? He got nothing out of the deal. You don't know God if you think he's going to do a deal and not come out on top. God has to come out on top in everything. Jewish people, I know you say you can argue with him because Abraham did. Yeah, go ahead. You can argue with him until you're blue in the face. You're never going to win. There's no winning. I asked him, I said, why don't we play a game of chess or something? Like, he, said, he said, kid, couldn't I, I, I beat you in like three moves every time. He said, I said, well, why don't you just kind of like let me win? 
<laughs> and the spirit started laughing. <laughs> he said, "Yeah, never happen." <laughs> This caricature that he puts into my mind, and this is all explained in the books, of course, these visuals. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm like a walking visionary, but it's not of the future. There's just all these pictures when we, and, and I can do it to them. I can, I can be trying to think of a store I want to go to, and I can't remember the name, and I just picture it in my mind. And boom, they got it. <laughs> so... It's just a way of communicating, my communication. Yeah, but that's good. If I was ever in negotiations with Middle East countries, or I'm dealing with kings, as it says in the scripture, I will, that they'll come to me, and we're trying to get things straight, you know, who knows where the world's headed. Um, they'll be right there. I'll say everything perfectly right for the people in the room and the people before me. Just what needs to be said, the perfect thing. Because he's perfect. And he can have me do and say anything he wants after training me up like this. You know, it's funny too, because I know I've, I've hit uh, um, uh, Miss Rabbi Tobia Singer a little bit, because I, I'm really upset with the way, because of his Isaiah 53, and because it's such a hindrance to myself, God, and the Spirit, to have all the Jewish people believe it can only be Israel, the Jewish people. And... Uh, and I know he's really reaching, I bet he knows he's really reaching on some of that, but it's worth it as an anti-missionary to fight Christianity, to bring Jews back to him. And I know that's what he's doing, that's fine. Like I said, I'm sure I'd like him, he's very personable, but, you know, God has me say things as he will have me say them. And what, what a great assist he would be for God in this thing. He's got radio shows, he's got all those followers, he's, he's got a nice setup for doing YouTube. <laughs> you know, I'm in this 40-year-old room that I call the adjunct of the holies of holies. And there's paint peeling everywhere and the pipes are shot. <laughs> yeah, this is the holy holies I'm talking from right here. The adjunct, it's not the, not the original one. But, uh, Intercession for the sinners. I don't, this, all this I pretty much covered, but I do have something to say about Jesus on this other than he doesn't, he doesn't fit in the verses in, in my video as far as I'm concerned, except this one. It's the sinner. It's the sinner. Jesus is said to be without sin. That he was crucified with the sinner on his left and on his right, count as one of them. Jesus may have looked and been thought of as a sinner for being among them, but he was still said to be sinless. Appearing to be a sinner is not the same as being a sinner. Being said to be unblemished and sinless is not the same as being unblemished and sinless. If somebody saying you are, doesn't make it so. And the scripture would tell us contrary. I've already given the biggest example. All the prophets say of me, I shall grind this ass. And the prophecy is responding to Zechariah. Pretty sure it's in Zechariah where uh, Moshe, the anointed one, he rides an ass in and defeats Rome which is what would happen in Jesus' time, and he's uh, appointed king basically of the world. Okay. Defeating Rome and being appointed king is the furthest thing from being spit on, mocked, scourged, crucified, and raised in on the third day. <laughs> I guess raised on the third day would be good. Nah, I think it's just a story. But um, they had the Egyptian gods and pharaohs and Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. What people believe in antiquity, you can go to History Channel or Google it. Found Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Good example of Jesus lying, being deceitful. Jesus changed, verse 10, from defeating Rome to being executed by him. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, fair Zion, raise a shout. Fair Jerusalem, lo, your king, the descendant of David, 
chapter 11, is coming to you. He is victorious, triumphant, yet humble, riding on an ass, on a donkey found by a she ass. Now, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm not going to ride an ass in to fulfill and fit this verse. The fact is, I am a humble man. I'm not humble like Moses, but God says you never know at the end of your life what you might be. He's still working on me. I need to keep working, baby. <laughs> this is the Holy Spirit. He can he can talk to me through me too. And you know, he and God, they're so close, so to speak. These two clouds, these different elements, and he, God created him and whatever he wants, whatever picture he wants in my mind, see, he doesn't have power. These angels don't have power. God's the only power in the universe. And yeah, he doesn't make an angel that's that power. He said, why would I do that? He said, i got to keep an eye on him anyway. I'll do the power. That's why he killed the first one of all of Egypt. It's not the angel of death. He, I said, you painted on somebody else's what you did when you wrote it up. Do you know what he did? He told, he told the spirit, he told the angel, hey, today i got to go down and uh, kill all the firstborn in Egypt here so I can get my people out. And it is real right. And he said, today, your name is Angel of Death. And I'll tell you, it would have tickled him to no end. His personality. I mean, he's, he was just like, oh, right, wow, Angel. <laughs> angel of Death. He does that just to be funny. I, I'm sure he's regal and statuesque and holy and everything else when he's not around me. But these kind of things make me laugh and they live with me. So anyway, I, I do that a lot. <laughs> oh man, I don't want to do that. This is an old Texas thing. This is a cowboy thing. So here's 10. He shall banish chariots from Ephraim. That's the northern kingdom. It had three names, Israel, Ephraim, and uh, um, the other name. And horses from Jerusalem. The warrior's bow shall be banished. He shall call on the nations to surrender. Jesus was right that ass into there. And, and, and call on the nations, the Middle East, to surrender. He's... <laughs> And his rule shall extend from sea to sea and ocean to lands in Zechariah chapter 9, 9 and 10. Now, he's one of these prophets. All the prophets say of me, when I ride this ass in, I get crucified. Can you find a bigger light, a bigger deceit? No, you can't. You know why? Because do you know how many billions of people have, have been deceived by that? Because they don't read those. They, they don't go look to see what Zechariah said. Jesus says all the prophets said of him, that's good enough for them. They don't have to check it out. In this age of information, the internet, God would beg to disagree. <laughs> yes, you do. And when you find out what you've been reading, you find all this lies in the seat of the most deceitful book ever written. Same, on the same basis. Billions. There's two billions of Christians right now believing all this. This human sacrament, you know, God's appalled at that. <laughs> he said, I'm making a human sacrament. What are they going to give me? Why would I do it? And they're going to accept human sacrifice. That's the Jews. They know better than that. And he, he told his people, don't sacrifice your children. Now, he's going to give laws and commandments to the Jews and then go do it himself? I don't think so. You know, he, he just don't know who he is. You know. You might have to go back to the Israelites in the biblical times to get a good handle on it. But I do know the Israelites went up to Moses, or one of them did, and said, Moses, Moses, you go talk to him and come tell us what he says. We're all going to die. <laughs> they were in fear. That's how people were about God. This concept that he's thinking, I, I don't know. You know, Christians were like mans and made their own human sacrifices of their fellow Christians. Now that I can kind of understand. If, they, if their theology was if we kill one of ours, then God will look favorable and forgive our sins. That makes more sense than God killed his kids so you can sin. <laughs> and people are giving up and going to heaven. 
Well, heaven's just for the Jews, Christian. I'm going to say it one more time. If you want to see heaven, Christians, you're going to have to convert to Judaism, be a good observant Jew. you got to become a Jew. I say it like that to everything. There's a whole lot of people who, who hit the thumbnails for my video, and they don't last a minute. <laughs> I figure 98% of the people are not Jewish. Only 2% are. There's some that hang in there and, and watch them all. I'm getting a great response. But uh, uh, Christians don't last long at all, I don't think. I don't know that to be a fact. I haven't done a survey or a study yet. So, this is what he said. That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet. Luke says he said this. This is in chapter 31 of... I don't really have much else to say on 12. I'm going to finish with Jesus here. It's 18, Luke, chapter 18, verse 31 through 33. Then he, Jesus, took unto him the 12th and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. That's just a term for you're a human being born of humans. <laughs> Son of Man. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked, spitefully entreated. He's speaking in the third person. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus says all things written by the prophets concerning him are accomplished by flying in Athens in Jerusalem to be delivered to the Gentiles, put to death. No prophet of the Hebrew Bible wrote this. This is not what Zechariah said. The Hebrew Bible, great scroll of Isaiah, the Apocrypha, that's what I was looking for, and the Pseudepigrapha are all the possible scripture that Jesus could be referencing and not one book mentions a son of man, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, a son of God, a man who is God, or any man to be delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, and put to death, a man who dies for the sins of other men, any man who is to rise from the dead on the third day, or a man who is sacrificed or made to, sacri made to sacrifice himself by God. This is just a big lie. And a manipulation of Hebrew scripture. And I pointed out another one earlier. The book of Hebrews says that when Israel violated his covenant, including Moses, that he abandoned them. So what is this? He married them. I espoused them. Selective reading by religious people, what are you going to do? Malachi. This is more deceit. This is under deceit better than lie for Jesus. Malachi 1, Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before them. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. Jesus uses Malachi 3, 1 that I just read to describe his cousin John the Baptist to be Elijah, but leaves out the angel of the covenant. Says, uh, this won't take long. It'll take me longer to splice and sing it and do all the things you got to do put these things together. So J Jesus uses Malachi 3, 1 to describe his cousin John the Baptist to be Elijah, but leaves out the angel of the covenant. Sin forgiveness for the Jewish people. There are only two specific covenants, and anyway, I've gone through all that. Clearly, the angel has the new covenant, David covenant of friendship. And God says, I'm going to grant it when David's here, and I'm going to appoint him to be a ruler amongst the flock. So you would imagine David is the one that delivers that. My appearance being Elijah, David, prophet like Moses, righteous servant, and Elijah is the messenger of the new covenant. David, the deliverer 
let you know about God's granting the covenant of friendship. So one man, one man fulfills the remaining, the, the, uh, the prophecies of God that have not been fulfilled in the day of the Lord. He's finishing up the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible with one man. Yeah, all they needed was Moses. I know he used Aaron too, it's particularly early on. But uh, it's pretty much Moses. Pretty much Moses. Um, you know, Aaron was to be a pro likened to a prophet to Moses, with Moses being God, you know, symbolically speaking. And God was actually speaking through him to Aaron. And on and on and on. This kind of tour stuff, I leave that alone. Stay away from that, Halakha, I stay away from it. Uh, oral tradition, stay away from it. But that has nothing to do with the end times and the, what the prophets are saying. Now I know, you know, except, you know, unless you go with the prophecies of the Messianic era. And I think a lot of that really is found in the prophets. Anyway, back to this, this John the Baptist was Elijah. Okay, it wasn't a time for the new covenant. Elijah's not supposed to be there. God's not going to be returning to his temple. He's, the temple hadn't been destroyed. He's not going to be returning to it. He's in it. They, it Jesus declares the day of the Lord, but it can't be. It doesn't fit Malachi 3 at all. Jesus said, this is he, John the Baptist, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Again, I think he's speaking to the third person, but that's Jesus. Jesus is saying that John was putting the way for Jesus as the Lord, as the Son of God, or God incarnate, and as renowned teacher of the scripture at synagogues as a young boy, Jesus knew that the Jewish people were, were without sin if John was Elijah. That is why he did not mention the angel of the covenant. These are the words God dictated to me. He cannot die for the sins of the Jewish people if they are sin free. God forgives sin by his written word, not human sacrifice. And here's the big one. In Jeremiah 38, chapter 31, verse 38, where it talks about seed time is coming, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. The last sentence is, they shall never be uprooted, overthrown, and uprooted again. Never defeated and dispersed again. That's why it's so important to avoid utter destruction. And what he's saying is, if you don't do this, they're going to get you eventually. I'm telling you, if I put my sanctuary amongst you, you're going to be, look at the covenant of friendship, you'll see. You're going to be free of taunts. You're going you're gonna to be secure. You're going to be safe. You're never, you never, know, and basically says the same thing. You're never going to be dispersed again. So, if Elijah's there, and he and he's supposed to have the covenant, it means it's the day of the Lord, and the Jews will never be defeated again. Well, what happened? Well, you had three revolts by the Jews against Rome, some 40 years later in 70 common era, and that, that's when the temple was destroyed. That was with the first revolt. There was two more after that. 50,000 were murdered and crucified and killed with swords and arrows uh, in the first revolt. It was huge. And, uh, but, but Rome won. And the Jews were dispersed. That's where the diaspora started. And that's what God had Jeremiah writing for when he said, write this down. It's some parchment in the style. Write this down. See your time is coming. You know, he told the Jews, I'm going to redeem you. I've got a day. I've got a guy. And I'm going to have a guy again. See, right here, 63. Got a guy. It's got a crazy description on it. It's, it's, it's going to do all kinds of things. And Isaiah couldn't have written it unless God told him, okay, now, now I want this. Here's the here's first sight. Here's first hand. Right? Okay, right there. You know, they're probably going back and forth. But Isaiah may have even said, well, how about this? And, you know, <laughs> God would listen to him and then God said, okay, now write what I said to write. <laughs> That's pretty much how it goes. Okay. 
So anyway, John the Baptist can't be Elijah. Period. Jesus doesn't mention the angel of the new covenant. He knows full well the Jews are forgiven of sin. He knows full well. He can't not know, especially if he's God incarnate or this great mind that can go to the synagogues and teach the rabbis when you're 12 years old. Don't tell me I figured out something Jesus couldn't. It's, it's tough enough to think that someone out there is going to say, well, he's just, he's just super smart. Really? I'm smarter than your greatest sages and rabbis? I don't think so. I've never been considered, I'm, I'm a smart guy, but I've got to work at it. Like, if I'm getting ready for a big test, i got to write it. i got to make a summary of everything I'm learning. It's the only way to make it stick in my head. You know, I'm not an intellectual, but I'm, like I said, I'm a lawyer. I did real well in the bar. I'm good at reading and comprehension. But I don't understand radio signals. I don't understand satellites. I don't understand TV. I don't, it just, I'll read it and say, okay, man, I don't get it. It just won't sink in, and that's the one I left out. As far as believing, and again, at this long time, but even this, the great belief the Jewish people had that God's actually going to do what he says. And it's, but it's not familiar to you. It's not what you're expecting. But I told him after two years, we're out walking, and this and that's going on. And I said, you know, I know you got. I feel your power. I see you teaching me things I'd have never known. But I still can't believe you exist. It just won't sink in. I can't believe this is a guy. I can't believe this entity, this 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 living being with this power and absolute knowledge and what he can do with my body and my mind. It's just it's it's beyond comprehension. It's inconceivable. <laughs> Holy Spirit loves me, this is a guy and some Pirates, you know, I think it is. Inconceivable. <laughs> he said, I want to explain. Anyway, I think I'm done. Now, here it is. Here, here's, here's where Jerusalem is supposed to be built. This is my closing words on Isaiah 53. See, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate, and the measuring line shall go straight out to the Garib Hill. And then turn toward Go, and the entire valley of the corpses and ashes, and all the fields as far as the Wadi Kidron and the corner of the horse gate, <laughs> these shall be holy to the Lord. They shall never again be a river overthrown. In my job as an oil, gas, and mineral law <clears throat> specialist, I would have to, to get uh, deeds from 200 years ago and had to figure out things like, it's it, beginning at the third stone by the big elm tree, <laughs> which of course is long gone. And you know, this is kind of like that, but, but God and I went through it as best we could, and, and he assures me Jerusalem is much bigger than the Jerusalem of antiquity that this is referring to. So, let's get a temple built, and let's never see the Jews defeated and dispersed again. Thank you for listening to all this, and, and uh, this is my Midrash on 53. Uh, there's actually more to it, and there's a lot of other things, which I believe we're going to be putting on YouTube here in the future. Uh, that's not focused in on 53, but still, it's about the Bible. It's just 